This is the Go Maluku Podcast. All right, Alexi, thank you so much for getting um, full disclosure so that you know. Um, I started this podcast literally um, to get people uh, for people like you, um, inspirational people that like you come across at the UN for years, um, but um, like, do you really know them? And do, do you, yeah, do, do I really know them? And there's so many things that I would like to pick, pick people like you, the brains about, but we don't ever have the time because, man, you, you've, you've grown uh, in, in, like, as a, you're a lifetime activist for one, but you've grown into the movement, uh, which is qu quite a remarkable journey if you think about it. Um, and it's only just what I see. Um, use caucus uh, a, a little bit, and then boom, uh, well, MRIP, and boom, now Prim Forum. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you should not be surprised, actually. I asked around a little bit. All right, I'm going, I'm having Alexei um, on the, um, on the podcast and um, any questions or is there anything that you would like to know and I kid you not nine out of the ten responses were like I'm totally starstruck by Alexei in terms of like how he uh, handles himself uh, how he moves through the movement um, helps the movement um, so Man, you got fans. You 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 have you have you have a lot of fans around the world, my, my friend. Um, so I want to start off with a compliment. Um, uh, of one of the many compliments that that are, that are coming down the road. Um, yeah, which makes me wonder, as in like, for people like yourself, um, sources of inspiration, motivation for other people as well. Um, yeah, what is. You don't have to dive deep into this, but um, I'm, I'm fascinated by, um, yeah, well, like why people do what they do, and what what is your your, your drive to do, to do all this? Um, and you don't have to answer right now, but I think throughout the conversation we'll we'll we'll, we'll get to it. Um, yeah, I think this is a this is a, a long winded way of me saying welcome to to to, to the to the podcast. Um, how are you doing, my friend? Um, thank you. Thank you, Ghazali. And uh, uh, I'm honored and very pleased to be here on your podcast. Uh, I know I have a lot of people following it. And uh, it's uh, for me, uh, it's also a very good way to, to reach out uh, those people and, and, and have a conversation, even if it's not uh, a direct interaction. But still, I know many people will listen and uh, will uh, move over those thoughts that we we will present here and then uh, as you said um, uh, so I have friends you have friends uh, a lot of friends around the world and uh, all these people all of them are very important for the movement and and uh, uh, so uh, it it's all it, it always uh, it only makes sense when we are working together as one as as a movement and um, so yeah I, I'm I'm really um, I'm, I'm, you know, starting off with the compliments as well. Uh, I'm really amazed of what you have done for the movement. Uh, you know, I saw you presenting uh, at the General Assembly uh, on that very important, most important podium probably uh, in, in the whole world. And this is something I haven't achieved yet. Uh, maybe I will, I don't know, but uh, this is um, a very symbolic but also, uh, I mean, uh, a very important uh, step uh, for all the indigenous peoples uh, across the world. So I, as you said, I, I have grown. Somehow I attended uh, my first meeting at the UN was 2010 uh, when I literally couldn't speak English very well. So I had to rely on DOSIP's um, interpreter's help. Uh, sometimes when I attended the Youth Caucus meeting, I most likely I was among those rare people uh, with, the inter with an interpreter there. So that I didn't understand sometimes what is going on in the room, but um, uh, I already had friends, including the Sami people 
you know, because I'm part of the Finno Greek movement and, and some is uh, too. So uh, we, you know, I, I speak Finnish. So uh, I, you know, through, through those Finnish Sami friends, I uh, got familiar with the uh, situation there. And it was pretty interesting and, you know, pretty different from what I've seen before um, in the Russian indigenous movement and the, even international Finno Ugric movement. So uh, the youth caucus and the long, very long deliberations that happen sometimes hours and hours and even at night uh, and beyond the, the official official rooms. Um, so it was all very important. But then I started to understand how uh, how probably I could you know, influence this or contribute to this. Um, so then, so it was 2010, and, I, and the permanent forum was uh, so uh, amazing. So it was uh, uh, I, literally, it was like I think it was even one of the symbolic meetings of the permanent forum because uh, uh, a U.S. representative stood up and, and said that uh, um, the UN declaration matters uh, for the for the United States and. and and so the, this is one of the countries that voted against uh, just a few years before that, uh, and then Australia and New Zealand. So, and and there was like literally you know ten minutes of um, you know people you know clapping and um, uh, happiness in the room because it was such a uh, uh, an important step forward and. Um, I, I didn't grasp that uh, at the moment, but I started to do that uh, after. And um, I started to understand also that um, all these, many of those people that are in the room, so they have had such a long, long career uh, in the UN. Um, and so uh, I, I was like, I said to, to OICHR fellows one time that I was like a kitten there uh, with no understanding what's going on. Uh, I didn't know how to sign up for a speaker's list. Uh, I didn't know what the caucus means and how caucus could, you know, help, you know, get your voice heard and something like this. So, and then uh, thanks God next year, there was a call for uh, OICHR fellowship program. Uh, 2011, maybe no, 2010. So when the time when I applied there, 2011 was selected and went through the through the program in Geneva, in Moscow. It was two months, very intensive uh, program, uh, and this is how I also, uh, you know, got new acquaintances, uh, new friends uh, around the world, and with some of them I really. I, I'm, I'm in touch uh, on a regular basis, so we we know what what is going on in each, in each other's lives, and um, we follow uh, each other's uh, careers and and so and help each other. So this is this is what this movement is all about. Actually, it's the the solidarity and uh, the help uh, and and the the fact that we can rely on each other. And, and 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 help help out. So um, and that uh, I think the OECHR fellowship program was really uh, such a thing that um, you know that gu guided me. You know and you know I studied how to navigate there really because before that I didn't know, uh, and so I. I understand how to be how to be more efficient uh, in the caucus, in the youth caucus, for example, in in the movement itself, and how and most importantly, maybe uh, how to uh, bring this back to my own community and how actually Karelians, for example, my indigenous people, and then the Finno Ugric movement and all indigenous peoples in in my, in my country could benefit from my participation because I didn't know I didn't want to to be just a a person who, who travels and for some people it's it seems like this so some people still think that uh, uh, people like me so they just travel to to meetings they they uh, see the world and um, do not 
have any impact, which is very regretful if if this is if this would be like this. So I I don't want this kind of legacy uh, behind me. So I I just I mean um, and I, and this is very hard to, to explain to these people when that uh, sometimes you don't even see uh, anything there except for the for the view from your hotel window uh, hotel room window or the the meeting room and the way between them so uh, sometimes it's just a very very hard hard work negotiations and you know it much better than me that all these negotiations that that happen behind the scenes and this is um, uh, this is what I what I learned uh, a lot and, and then um, after this program uh, I think I was invited to to be a fellow at the UN house in, in Moscow. So the UN country team in Moscow, the OICHR representation there. Uh, it was a three, three months of fellowship or internship, I think. Uh, and then there was a call for, for nominations for, to EMRIP. So of course I knew what is EMRIP already and um, I knew pretty well what kind of people are there. So experience, very experienced experts. I didn't think I would go through, but I, I received calls from my communities, not only from my own, my own, but some neighboring indigenous communities and those leaders. So they, they said that I should go there. I should try at least, which I did. And um, unexpectedly for myself, I was selected. And, and I think um, there was a, a logic behind that. And it was also in the explanation note uh, from the, from the five ambassadors that did the review. So they said that uh, th there is a need for uh, a um, generational balance in this, uh, need. that was a fresh, still fresh uh, body, it is still. Um, so there, there was a need for that kind of intergenerational um, interaction. And, uh, and this, is, this is really true. So I was like probably the, the youngest person there uh, in Emrip and surrounded by, I would say, mastodons of the indigenous movement. So people who really know everything, every single seed, Chief Little Child, for example. So he knows um, every single seed. He, he, um, he sat uh, at every single meeting, like uh, since 70s, right? So it is, um, uh, it was, just a lifetime chance for me to to learn from people like him and others, Jenny Lassinban from uh, Malaysia um, and many other people. So it is like a, a very serious life school. Um, and when I say something like I participated in mandate review and this kind of, so it is just uh, a little tiny bit of what all of all this, all these my colleagues have done through their careers. And um, I remember one meeting, the very first meeting actually, I attended as I'm, I'm, as I'm an expert um, uh, and my English was still not very good. So I sometimes relied on, in, on interpretation, uh, translation and so on. And then we had a discussion because uh, most of the work actually happens also behind the scene. It's like when you have listened to Every, all these statements and then you go to the room and uh, have, have a discussion with other with the, with the colleagues uh, about the, uh, the text of the outcome document of the meeting and the recommendations to the Human Rights Council and uh, all these uh, important things. So um, I remember I said something inappropriate like um, at the meeting probably I said something like uh, the UN declaration is not a legally binding document but still has a very symbolic value and, and so on and so forth, which is um, legally speaking uh, uh, true. Uh, but then I also um, didn't understand that uh, this declaration is actually a legally binding document. It's not only a symbolic document, it's a, it's a legally binding document because all the states as one, I mean, it was, after it was 2014, so they re reiterated uh, at the World Conference their support for the declaration. So there is no sin one single state in the world who is opposing or um, 
you know, doubting on something in the document. So this is a, a global consensus. And therefore, this is now legally binding. Also because it is consistent of things that are already existing in other legally binding documents. So it is, um, it is um, something that Chief Little Child said like uh, in our closed meeting, that, uh, meeting that Alexei, maybe you would like to remove this, your citation from the document <laughs> because it would undermine something that indigenous people think this think are is important and i said um uh of course so i i, I mean i um that was a uh a, 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 a lesson i learned uh at the very first meeting uh of, um, i attended as expert and so i understood then that there will be a, a very long way uh towards uh, the real expertise uh and so i, I understood that uh, i have the responsibility and the, um i have i have to learn really from 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 those people and i have to to do my best to you know not to just sit down there and listen and speak sometimes um things that i think are important but but um i should be very mindful of the real um you know real goals and real uh matters that indigenous peoples think are important uh when they go to un thank you so much alexi for for laying that out um especially the last part not everything but especially the last part when you talk about um you have an idea or you said something and you're in the most positive ways, you receive feedback, right? From, from uh, oh, well, chief little child right now, um, that you have that, yeah, how, how should I say it? Is that humility? Is it, is it um, what is it that you made you say, like, oh yeah, sorry, you, um, I, I rev I'll, I'll review that. Um, as I know that a lot of other experts or no, no, sorry, not that are people, not experts, people that are, would cling on to, to a cer certain, uh, to the position or to, to the perception of, of things. And I don't, I don't know, like the way that you explained it. And thank you so much for explaining like the, the, the behind the scenes a little bit. Um, yeah, like the, the um, um, yeah, how should I say it? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I want to say just I'm, I'm impressed um, by by the way that you handled handled that particular situation. Um, given that you have, yeah, uh, um, like you said, you know, 2010 first first entering ent entering the UN, boom, uh, OHHR fellowship program, then you 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 dangle your feet in the water. For, to for for the the um, to become expert member of the of the of the MRIP, and so it is um, it is 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 it is a path that a lot of other people would take 10, 20, maybe even thirty years uh, to to do it. Um, again, impressed, very much impressed. Um, in and also eager to to learn how did you actually get um into how did you find out about the fellowship program because you use caucus and you you, you try to get to, through the motions try to understand what it is how did you um uh, come into contact with the the fellowship program yeah so i uh specifically i mean because i attended this permanent forum session 2010 so i I think I, I learned about uh, many many uh, things happening around um, at that meeting, but also I specifically looked uh, looked up information that is relevant to uh, to the Finno Greek movement because at the time I was the president uh, president of the International uh, Youth Association of Finno Greek Peoples that was uniting uh, forty around forty uh, NGOs of indigenous uh, of Finno Greek peoples, not only indigenous but but Finno Greek. Uh, so um, 
and I, I had a goal in front of me to, uh, you know, to get uh, to integrate our movement to the international movement, because I think uh, we uh, at that time in Russia, we had uh, a very difficult situation uh, in terms of the recognition of, of our work. And, and so we as international organization started to, to receive bad um, kind of feedback from uh, from the government that so um, and and so uh, they, they started to exclude us from processes and I thought that um, this inter international uh, movement uh, and integration would be for us a way uh, to to get hurt uh, so um, and and yes um, because at the session of the forum I I spoke to many indigenous people still through the interpreter or, or, or in Finnish or Russian language that I know. So, uh, and then uh, some of them mentioned this program that this is a, a very uh, powerful uh, instrument. Uh, so uh, then I just applied and um, uh, and was successful in that process. So, uh, and I, I'm really happy that I went for that because it is, um, uh, I mean, at least this Russian-speaking component. I think it's one. Of, it is one of the strongest components because it has one month in um, in Russia uh, in the Russian University of Friendship uh, uh, that has a very strong department of uh, of law, international law, uh, whose chair Professor Abashidze is uh, uh, a long-term expert of uh, some human rights bodies treaty bodies um human rights committee i think um so um and we have we had an intensive four weeks um session in 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 that university and then we went to geneva already knowing many things that will happen uh but uh that was a very good practice because we kind of um interacted as one group so not only russian speaking but also french english uh speaking groups and Spanish speaking groups, so all together. Uh, and uh, we lived in a, in a dorm, I think, uh, it was a Mandat International, such a, such a place. So <laughs> uh, that's a very good place in terms of, you know, because we, we, we were so close to each other, all of us. So we had uh, those moments of speaking to each other, even like with no clue of, like, of each, each other languages, but still, that there was a, uh, a conversation um, and um, and uh, learning from each other. <laughs> yeah, so the, the fellowship program was really. Uh, I think without that, I couldn't couldn't do anything. Yeah, um, funny you mentioned Man Mandat Inter International. It is so people so people have an idea, right? Let, let, let us describe it a little bit. It's a mansion all the way outside it's it's like i don't know 45 minutes one hour by bus outside of geneva and it's to get to that mansion there are two ways to get to that mansion either you take a very um yeah you take the road which takes you along a lot of other um yeah there's a road to to get to it but it goes through a forest and you, you pass all these buildings with barbed wire and you don't know what what that is but it's also a shortcut. And that shortcuts makes you um, have to go through a field. Um, yeah, like a, very, a big, huge field. I don't know, like, it's like three to four football fields. Mm. And it is, and this mansion is on top of the hill. And it used to be belong to, if I'm not mistaken, or William Rap, uh, Rapar lived in it. And it's been converted into, yeah, kind of a it's called a welcome center but it's like a like a hostel thing uh, a hostel eh, for in, for for delegates and jails and these peoples primarily um to yeah to live in in, in dorms and i don't know like, there, there's several levels and um some are level for women some are levels for 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 men i oh and i don't know why but uh, every time i stayed at mandat it was always in the basement and they always mm. make me make, make me uh, stay in the basement, um, which was fine, you know. And and it's it's a it's a homely feeling that is at least what it what it gave me. Um, and you get to connect with indigenous peoples from all around the world. You sit in the, the big 
um, dining area or on the front porch or back porch, sorry, um, with a cup of tea and you have a little bit of a chat with with people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so to describe what what, what Alexi is is um, about about Manda, it is it, it was an environment uh, that uh, yeah you, it it was geared towards people interacting with with one another and um, um, yeah you 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 share a dorm or or a, or a room uh, but you also share coffee or tea or, or, or whatever and um, yeah I've been for, up until it it was real, remained open uh, or still did the welcome welcoming center thing um, yeah most of my time when I went to Geneva I stayed at that place um, even though like also, we had to take the V bus uh, to, mm -hmm. to 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 get to that place, which was um, you knew that it would take like it would take you an hour and a half um, to 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 get to the place, and you you um, felt um, yeah, it it is not fun if, if you miss the bus because uh, it makes you make you <laughs> it makes you like wait another hour to get to to get to the um, for for the for the for another bus because it's not as frequent as it as um as it is like a normal city bus um alexa you you are a um how should i say it one one of the people that to me are one of the champions of the the fellowship program correct um could you mm -hmm. explain a little bit because now you have your own experiences but in terms of like what the the fellowship program actually is uh, um, so that people imagine a, a, a young Russian, um, oh, sorry, from the Russian region, indigenous person inspired by, by, by your story, right? and, and here's you, your, um, your journey. Here's you talking about the fellowship program. Um, yeah, what is it and how can it contribute to, to that person? Yeah, so I, I mean, as I said, this uh, uh, program is is really very powerful um, because of two reasons. It it um, um, you know gets you in touch with real experts or those who work for the system, those who have had a lot of um, you know work um, in the indigenous movement. So. Uh, and also uh, because of the connections that you get, uh, the network of former fellows is, is, is growing, it's very large. And, and so um, it is also a, a good way to interact uh, with governments because, I mean, we had, for example, in the Russian version of this, this program, so in, in Moscow components, we visited some of this in, these bodies that um, uh, are in charge of indigenous policies. Uh, indigenous, uh, I mean, uh, human rights institutions or ministries, the parliamentarians, and and so on. So and and the RIPON, of course, the uh, I mean, other indigenous organizations in Russia. So we we had the we had a chance to you know to um, familiarize ourselves with all this relevant information. We did a great reading. Um, uh, to, so we are, we were given a lot of material to to. To read and to watch and so on and and then in Geneva it was um, it was uh, like a practice because we had a whole week attending the the session of uh, of the Emrip uh, and then it was the last week of the fellowship and the the three weeks so of also we attended all these uh, different meetings that happened you know to happen to happen in Geneva for example like committee meetings and so on. Uh, and we met uh, officials, UN officials, and um, uh, UN employees, and, and so on. And that was um, uh, like a practice. So we we understood how we can apply this information that we received, that the theory that we received in in the academic environment. So uh, and of course, the I mean, Geneva experience itself is is very important because it's an international city. It's a uh, it's a city where lots of negotiations uh, have happened throughout history. And, and so, um, and you get all of this uh, spirit uh, by walking those streets and, you know, uh, having conversations with people 
and and you see like even that mandat international for example like one evening um so we we drank coffee or beer outside and, and then somebody came uh who happened to be a, a a diplomat from burkina faso or another african state i don't remember exactly but but he was like um so <laughs> so he understood he, he fought so he when he booked the hotel so he uh by, i mean seeing this name he understood this is a very um a, a very fashionable like uh, um respectable uh, place because of the name and he wondered why this is so sh so cheap right so he um he wanted to to save money for you know to buy um uh sneakers for his kids and and so he went there and he <laughs> he realized this is not a hotel even so but but he still you know stayed there uh because he wanted to save the money and so he you know he we had a, a great conversation there so you you never know when you, when and uh, where you encounter somebody uh who would tell you a story or uh, uh maybe uh, does a favor uh that uh would be important for you at some point of your life so um and this fellowship gives such opportunities so as i said this is like a key for indigenous peoples who want to explore the united nations um for professional or activism uh, purposes uh I think this is necessary to to go to this program because otherwise, I mean, one could could get um, this information just uh, by doing, learning by doing. Uh, but um, fellowship is quicker; it's um, is more efficient if you go there uh, and and get that uh, is already presented. Uh, and of course, the, there is an intergenerational, you know, memory um, that. Um, is collected by this program because all these fellows fellows that participate every year so they contribute with their knowledge uh and the you know officers in charge uh, at the un so they uh kind of carry this this knowledge from one group to another so this is this is very good um and also like it it is interesting that uh, russian fellowship program for example this russian component is somehow paid by the Russian government. So the Russian foreign ministry uh, contributes to the OSCHR with some two millions of dollars, I think. Uh, that's what they say. And one million especially goes to um, to this program and to another program that the UN country team in Russia runs, which is the masters, uh, Human Rights Masters Program, which is a, um, a university uh, network uh, who uh, you know, uh, develops um, um, you know professionals in um, uh, teaches professionals in human rights, which is important. Uh, but and the, when the, there was an evaluation last year, I think uh, of the fellowship, and so they asked um, different questions about this impact of the Russian um, Russian money, uh, whether this money goes with some substantial influence. And my answer is simply. No, I personally haven't haven't seen any any stuff like that. So I haven't seen any any influence. But the opposite took place. So the Russian, when I asked, because I was wondering why the <laughs> government would pay for this kind of program, so they kind of develop uh, a group of people that would oppose them, uh, possibly in international arena, and um, argue with them, which takes place sometimes. And they said that. Um, uh, it is important for the government to have qualified counterparts on the other side of the table, which I really value. This is so important because if the government understands, and I think that not all of the people who work for the Russian government understand this, uh, this uh, uh, pathos of this, uh, right? But in the, in the foreign ministry, there are people who understand that. At least that's good. Uh, so it is very important that for the government to understand that uh, they need a counterpart to discuss things. And the more developed, the more qualified, the more knowledgeable that those people are, the better for the government itself, because uh, it is, you know, it is a real dialogue then, which could lead to, to good decisions and, and good uh, solutions, not only for, uh, like for, both, for, for all sides, for all who participate in that dialogue. 
so I'm, I think um, uh, this program is about dialogue too. So, I mean, not only about knowledge, not only about uh, experience, but also about dialogue. Um, for oh, for a lot of indigenous peoples and non-indigenous peoples, sorry, no, I'm generalizing. Um, for me, at least, for me, um, there's a lot that we know about indigenous peoples living in the Arctic, a lot of, that we know about indigenous peoples living in North America, Latin America. Um, Russian region is still a little bit of a gray area for me. Um, obviously, having this conversation with you is is such an eye, not an eye opener, but it gives a little bit more depth, gives a little bit more color to the indigenous peoples region, um, the, the Russian region, which is, has a long name, but I'm, I'm not going to spell it all out. Um, and now that you say that um, um, that the Russian region is is the Russian government is doing this to level to raise the level of of, of debate? Like I think that that is it's such a good idea, I would say, and like like uh, raising the level of debate is um, I don't know is is that. Is that a misconception that people and uh, these people have about the Russian government that they're anti-indigenous, or is there more nuance in that? Um, 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 how do you look at it? Yes, I mean um, it is so it is very complex, actually, um, as probably every single country is very complex on Russian. Uh, Russia is, is is very complex too. Not only because of the vast uh, vast, ter vast territories, um, and actually, um, so this this region that that uh, is um, separately um, named, uh, you know, Eastern Europe Russian Federation, Central Asia, and Transcaucasia, but st still many people who who live in, in the Russian North, for example, so they have a double. Uh, double mentality, I think, because they they belong to this region, and this is because of their belongingness uh, to to Russia as the as the citizens of this country. But also, they are um, you know they are living in the Arctic, uh, in in those high north latitudes. So they they live there, and they they also have the Arctic mentality. So that that's why they sometimes participate in in Arctic caucus meetings, and and sometimes they participate in in this uh areas uh meetings and and uh, and so on so uh, it is kind of complex in terms of the um you know the perception mentality of of the indigenous peoples themselves and so uh the indigenous peoples uh who populate this area are also very different um and uh so some colleagues argue that um uh, only indigenous small number of peoples uh, can or can participate in indigenous international indigenous movement and and UN meetings because uh, because of their you know special vulnerability and so they are smaller than fifty thousand people uh, by by number and this is the definition that the Russian legislator had uh, put in place uh, so and it's pretty unique so now I think. There, there is no other country that has this kind of uh, uh, numerical restriction on on the definition. Uh, but of course, um, and even like when experts visit, for example, the previous special rapporteur Jim and Aya, when he visited Russia, uh, he put in in his in in his country report uh, that uh, not only, I mean, the, the Russian government should also you know, um, take care of those indigenous peoples who exceed the, the numerical bar of 50,000 people. So, uh, because they otherwise have similar characteristics, it's just a number. And, and if, if we look at this, uh, you know, some indigenous peoples across the world have, um, they are big by numbers, like some millions sometimes and uh, they are still indigenous. Uh, so it's not about number. And in Russia, um, uh, we have indigenous small number and peoples that have special guarantees, constitutional guarantees, 
so a different legal status in, in the Russian um, system. Uh, but there are also others who, who are also indigenous and, and they don't have such, such guarantees and such uh, uh, legal protection uh, that state uh, extend to them. Uh, and um, there is a, a debate, a real debate on, on this um, in the region. So I think it's, um, it, it's, it's not something that could be resolved very quickly, but, but I think the, the solution is that um, um, I mean, those, all, all these people can participate and, and can use all the mechanisms available in order to, to raise their own uh, problems that are similar, actually, uh, and, um, you know, get together and um, use each other's help uh, to, to improve the whole picture, because otherwise it's not possible, I think. Um, yeah, and in terms of the, the, the government, so it, it, is, it is very complex too, because the, the government is not very monolithic. Uh, it is, like we say, <laughs> uh, even Kremlin has multiple towers. And, and some of those towers uh, don't agree with each other sometimes. So, uh, and that's true because in the power, there are different coalitions and movements and uh, lots of very complex interests uh, and groups of interest. And um, indigenous peoples happen to live as everywhere in the world in areas very rich of mineral resources, gas, oil, uh, other extractives. And, um, and that's why for indigenous peoples, it's dramatically uh, crucial to navigate themselves in this system so understand what is going on what are the groups of interest what are what, what it is not straightforward you cannot just you know say that the russian government is evil uh and there is no no ally no possible ally there and um as it is for example in finland uh, i i visited as uh, part of a, an emrip um delegation there so we uh and i, I noticed that uh finnish samis uh the sami parliament has especially uh very well established con contacts with the foreign ministry uh so foreign ministry is their ally in the government but some other government agencies like the forestry agency for example are are not so um are not um, kind of friends of them so they, they have ar arguments with, with them. Uh, and the same, the same here. So we, we, we see that there are you know, agencies that are more or less supportive, others not so much like the fishery, uh, the agency that is in charge of the, of the fishing, for example. So this is absolutely, it's, it's amazingly um, um, and strangely uh, stubborn. So they don't, they, they, even if they, it seems like they understand, but they, you know, they seem that they, they seem not understanding <laughs> that what indigenous people even demand and what is written in the in the law that, uh, so they have to have access to fish, and to food and you know this is part of their uh, system so you know food systems, um, and this is guaranteed by law by constitution, and they still don't understand that they they still uh, set in place. Um, uh, different uh, obstacles for indigenous peoples to fish, to get access to, to, to these uh, biological resources and exercise their traditional way of life. Uh, and they say that, uh, so indigenous peoples have so many communities, there, there is not so much fish there to, to satisfy all of them. So, um, I mean, this is beyond the, uh, you know, <laughs> beyond the beyond. I mean, it is not even possible to, to criticize uh, uh, because it, it seems like the level of um, the level of training of those people is is very low, or uh, it might be just the opposite. It might be that there is a special um, kind of goal that they uh, they try to reach. I don't know, uh, but but yeah, as I said, some agencies uh, are very difficult counterparts. So it, it is difficult to have even dialogue 
uh, with them. But but some yeah, I mean the foreign ministry uh, is is pretty uh, flexible in terms of having conversation, uh, and th I mean for obvious reasons. So they, this is their kind of diplomatic role, uh, uh, and there are some other like the federal agency on uh, ethnic affairs. Um, so this is a, a an interesting animal there in the in the government structure. It's a, a pretty new, uh, you know, pretty new body, um, and uh, sometimes not uh, consistent of qualified people. But some people are qualified, and, and we could rely on them. And um, it is at least possible to have a conversation. I remember one time um, at the permanent forum. Uh, I came there as I was still on MRIP, I think. Um, and there was um, head of that agency, Mr. Barinov, Igor Barinov. Uh, so he, um, he was the head of the Russian official delegation. And he made a statement and disappeared uh, from the room. And uh, as did all of his you know, people that followed him like from the delegation. I don't know what was the program. But I came to the to the foreign ministry representative there, and I I said like, um, would it be possible to, to you know to have a, a meeting with with the head of the Russian delegation? So I'm a UN expert uh, for five years already, and haven't had a chance to discuss with you know with such people. Uh, not in Moscow, not because I don't, don't live in Moscow. So, but uh, but also here. Uh, and this is exactly the place where these conversations must happen. And they they said like, oh, uh, that probably would be so difficult. He has a, a very serious, very packed program. So like, what kind of packed program he has? I mean, this is the permanent forum. He's the head of delegation to the permanent forum. He must be here. <laughs> so uh, you know, next hour, I received a call from the aide to to the uh, to the head of the delegation. And this, they, um, they wanted to set a meeting. So I, I invited other experts. So there was a permanent forum expert, Dmitry Harakovlaitsev, and uh, Aysamu Kabenova, who, is, uh, who was another forum member uh, uh, who worked for the foreign ministry as well. So, and we, we had the three of us had a, a very emotional meeting, actually. So it was in, in e, what is it called, East Lounge, something like this, in, um, in the UN building. Um, uh, and there was a very emotional meeting, so it was um, a, a serious arg argument there. Uh, but I think it was very helpful because we at least um, released uh, what we had in mind. And um, my only wish was that this would not be an isolated um, a meeting, but um, it would just uh, trigger, uh, you know, uh, a set of um, uh, meetings, not only in New York, but also in the capital, in indigenous uh, places. And, and um, I, I, I hope that would happen, but it didn't happen actually. So it was just uh, for me, at least, it was um, just the only meeting with this person. And, and um, um, despite the promises, he never invited me to, to any other uh, events and, and, and so on. Um, so I, um, yeah, the, the basic idea here, uh, answering your question, is that the, it's not monolithic. It is, I, could, I, I cannot say that uh, the whole Russian government is impossible uh, to speak with, um, but it is difficult. It is honestly saying it's difficult, even if um, sometimes when we uh, speak about the declaration, for example, uh, I know many people, and so, uh, not many, but some people, uh, reiterate all the time that Russia, I mean, doesn't recognize the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I, uh, I think differently. Uh, so Russia didn't vote uh, for the declaration. So Russia abstained. Uh, and the legal position, because I asked the um, foreign minister, why don't you want to, uh, to do the same as the US did and Australia and New Zealand and Canada did? And that would be just a uh, you know, a moment of pride for indigenous peoples of, of this country. So we will, you know, stand up and, and clap and, you know, there will be 
just a moment of pride and, and it was such a symbolic thing and they said that no russia uh wants to follow very strictly uh the procedures of the united nations so there is no such procedure uh at the united nations to reconsider the vote that was given at some point so this is a very uh old school conservative diplomatic position uh by the russian government and 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 uh, and yes i said like uh okay but i still think that after 2014 uh, russia is no longer among those abstained russia has joined uh the other the international community you know signing the the outcome document of the world conference so and since then uh russia is part of this global consensus and that's why i think uh i mean we should not reiterate all the time that russia is, doesn't recognize we should say russia recognizes and we should use uh the un declaration as a reference in our domestic advocacy in courts everywhere uh, because Russia really recognizes and and um, and as one diplomat said at, at the uh, 10th anniversary of the UN declaration in the Human Rights Council, Russian diplomats said that UN declaration uh, is considered as a, um, uh, as a uh, what was he said um, like a like a perfect. Uh, uh, you know, document that everybody should follow. Uh, yeah, so, and th th this is simply uh, what I think we, we should have in mind when we deal with the Russian government. Um, such an interesting insight <clears throat> in, into, um, into um, the Russian dynamics, I, I would say, um, um, at, at, the, at the UN and also domestically. Is, do you see a um a difference between the russian government in moscow as well as the the russian government or um in, in at the permanent mission to the un and do you, do you approach them differently um or is it, is it I, I, oh, sorry do you also approach them differently differently um i mean <laughs> Yeah, so uh, there, there is a difference in, in terms of the, uh, they still represent the same, the same country, uh, but um, sometimes I think that the, the, those people who, who work for the mission, so they have more understanding of the international, uh, international law and, and all these conversations that happen, all these processes, so they, you know, it is easier to you know, to deal with them because they understand the matter, they, uh, they understand the, uh, the consequences for the Russian, for the prestige, for the uh, Russian image in, on international arena. Um, so they understand the nuances because they have been sometimes part of the negotiation and, and so on. Uh, and it is not like this with um, the government officials in Moscow, because they sometimes change. Uh, sometimes then they don't, you know, look into things very deeply. Um, and um, yeah, so um, it, it is kind of different, but, but I see what is happening that is um, like a, the, the federal agency that I mentioned. So the, uh, some people who work there, so they, they really grow so they they learn how to you know how to use those instruments as well so they 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 learn how to understand what is written uh in the uh treaties and in the declaration so which which is which is very uh promising and important and uh, and also i see progress because for instance this um uh, like 10 years ago for example when i mm, first joined the the un uh I, I heard some statements um, in like about indigenous languages, for example. So they said uh, some government officials, even like coming to New York and saying, um, you know, this language nest methodology, which is efficient in Finland or New Zealand, would be not efficient in Russia because it is a different context, different 
different um, environment. But 10 years after, uh, and uh, at the opening of the international year of indigenous languages, uh, uh, another official uh, already says that uh, the, the language nest is such a, a very good uh, method that we have to, to borrow it and, and, and put here you know, in place so it would help. Uh, and th this is coming through this international process and international participation. So I'm really happy that this tiny small things that uh, uh, in, even in re rhetorics sometimes, uh, but sometimes also in practice, so it, it, it goes from there. And, and this is why it is important to participate uh, in, in, in these activities. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned languages. Um, for people that don't know, like you've been super involved with the International Year of Indigenous Languages. Um, congratulations as well uh, for the establishment of the International Decade on Indigenous Language. Um, I think that's a monumental thing that you've accomplished um uh, that um yeah a lot of people should know about um and you mentioned language nests um so um i think in Aotearoa new zealand it's uh kohanga reo uh, so uh, that's um, the language nest and that they've been using that as a model as well in, in finland uh for the for the sami particularly and i think yeah there should be a lot more uh, russia and all the other um political states where indigenous people live, that there, sh there should be, at least in my view, a uh, language nest as well. Um, yeah, how is language a, um, an, how important is language to indigenous peoples um, from your perspective as a, a Karelian, a son of a Karelian community, um, Fina Ugric uh, um, language, group is, is, is that the right right way to say it yeah it's like language family almost yeah yeah language family um yeah uh, from because yeah you you went from through through the motions mrip and everything and, and now you um now you also did the international year for indigenous languages um yeah could you give us a, an idea how that process went and and towards the establishment of this decade and maybe start with like how important language is uh, according to you for, for indigenous peoples. Yeah, yeah, thanks for this question. It's really uh, very dear to my heart, uh, these languages and, and so I even decided to, I mean, my, by my first training, I'm a linguist uh, and now decided to also uh, pursue the PhD uh, uh, in Colorado. Uh, the University of Colorado to you know learn even more about this and how this how actually um, or could could the uh, methods like languageness be universal and uh, be used uh, everywhere and um, how uh, indigenous communities could develop this kind of new innovative methods to revitalize and, and safeguard the, their languages. So languages are so important, I think. Uh, in in Finno Ugric movement, for example, uh, uh, languages uh, are, I think, top priority. So it is number one priority. Um, even at the expense of some economic rights, it's not so much discussion on on economic rights uh, compared to language culture. Uh, and I mean, because of that, probably um, when I joined the UN, um, I had this agenda um, in front of me. So the language culture, and this is what I, uh, among others, of course, but what uh, uh, you know, uh, pushed forward. Uh, and I remember 2016, I think, um, or yeah, I was um, uh, chair of AMRIP at that time. So, and there was a, 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 an expert group meeting in, um, by, organized by the Permanent Forum in New York um and uh, my my good friend and uh forum member at the time uh oliver lode from estonia uh so he um was in charge of that meeting somehow like ideologically and he uh proposed the topic for the meeting which was language um and so we had a, a coordination meeting uh you know in a 
So we, I think we shared an apartment somewhere and so um, and discussed um, uh, what what both of us could do that this meeting would be efficient. And so I, I said that I think we should do something symbolic uh, to achieve something, you know, um, something symbolic, maybe provocative, and then um, that that could be, you know, so we should propose something that nobody could uh, abandon or um, or say this is not important or something, but which could be easily um, agreeable for the most of the parties uh, involved. So something safe uh, that states would feel this is safe. Um, and I mean, language seemed to be like this, uh, you know, like a safe thing to speak about, safe thing. It's not, you know, economic, it's not gas, oil, it, it's just language. Uh, what, what, that, that's what I think. Um, language and culture, something soft. So, and we uh, kind of discussed that um, maybe this idea of the international year would be good. Um, and we, we agreed that I would, you know, feature this in my speech as one uh, important suggestion. And then we also spoke with Chief Ed John, who was there, uh, Chief Little Child and other uh, participants of the meeting. And, and we had a consensus around this idea. So uh, everybody thought this is such a good idea and nobody even knows anymore like who first created it. It was, it was like a collective uh, idea at that meeting. Uh, and what the most fascinating thing here is that that was such a quick process. I, I've never seen, uh, of course, I'm still quite new to the UN compared to other, uh, some other people. Uh, but um, over those 10 years that I've, uh, I've been there, uh, it is the most quick, the fastest process ever. Uh, so we proposed the international year in 2016 in January. And uh, at the end of the same year, December 2016, uh, the General Assembly already proclaimed it. Uh, so I, I was, I, I didn't, I couldn't believe that because <laughs> some processes, you know, last forever, like WIPO process, you know, it's, uh, it's just a disaster. But, <laughs> but what, what happened there in General Assembly, it was just so quick. And Russia was very helpful. Russia said that, okay, we, that's a very good topic. So we want to champion it. We want to organize an organizing committee in, in, in domestically. And, and so Russia did. Uh, and many other countries like Canada said they would uh, review the legislation on, on languages. So it, it was, uh, on one hand, it was safe for states, you know, to pursue this topic. And uh, on the other hand, it was, um, uh, it, it could be a moment of, uh, you know, reestablishing practices on languages, because as, as we wrote in, in the EMRIP statement at that time, uh, it is the time, I mean, uh, it, it is the time for action that seemed to be untimely or impossible before. So state, states could reconsider their approach on languages and, and um, in, in a good way. Uh, so I think, uh, of course, with one year, it, it was not possible to, to achieve everything, all the goals. But what happened is the very serious uh, awareness raising campaign about the critical loss of languages, about the problem itself, uh, and the, the challenges and the, you know, kind of, um, so the, uh, the doubts that indigenous peoples had about this year, uh, and rightfully had, so they were um, kind of eliminated by, by the practice itself. Because I mean, some people said, I, I think uh, that this international year of language of, of indigenous languages could uh, shadow the more important topics. Uh, for example, the you know, economic rights and um, uh, traditional livelihoods and so on, because everybody would speak about, about language that's but we, we, uh, we found a, a good way how to go around it. So we just linked languages to all other rights, which is true because languages are, uh, all human rights are indivisible. So they are part of the same system. So the, 
you cannot just speak about languages and not speak about culture, um, traditional livelihood and land rights even. So everything is bound together. And, and this year uh, was uh, important because of these interlinkages. So we kind of featured them, uh, we shed light on them. Uh, and the human rights, a human rights based approach was the governing approach uh, in, in, in that process which was sometimes pain, painful with UNESCO, especially because, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to, to criticize a lot. UNESCO did a good job, actually. UNESCO, uh, and especially with this small team that UNESCO has on languages, uh, Irungarda Kasinkaita is, uh, is a central person there. She's, uh, uh, you know, and her, her small group of colleagues, they just do such a good job in terms of you know, uh, pursuing this in the system. Uh, but it is difficult with UNESCO sometimes because languages is not a priority for them, especially indigenous languages. And indigenous peoples, so to say, uh, is not a priority either for this pretty conservative um, uh, French-based organization, right? <laughs> and and the, the fact that it is in France uh, has a lot of impact on it. Uh, that's that's right. So um, and and that's uh, that's why uh, we. Uh, I mean, another goal and um, another another achievement of this year was to um, you know to turn a little bit UNESCO to our direction, to the indigenous direction, and and then uh, the idea of having a decade. I think it, it, it's 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 very important because um, now we have. 11 years with the preparations and um, follow up and uh, even more than 11 um, to really focus on languages and what is around languages. So simply everything uh, about indigenous peoples. But, but I think the main goal here is to uh, have a plan. So, so the, the, the year was about awareness raising and the decade is about action. So we have to have a plan on every single dying language or language in danger because situations are different. So the, there should be a good cooperation between scientists, indigenous activists, practitioners, teachers, governments, business uh, around having a plan and then implementing that plan. Um, be before I move on, because uh, move on to like the more the, the specifics of the decade, because I'm I'm in intrigued by it. Um, there's something that I need to know from you. Um, while you were chair of the MRIP, I've been observing you. You're my friend. Um, I I'm I'm in again I'm impressed, and you were you became MRIP member, then you became chair, and there's something that I noticed about you, and. Um, I just want to know if, if, if I'm right, if I'm right, or I'm just making this up in my head. Um, when you speak, you, obviously you speak in Russian um, as, a, as a chair, because this is language, this is a crossover between languages and, and diplomacy. Um, so when you speak as a MRIP chair, I hear you speak in Russian, but you keep your earpiece on. And Sometimes I, I hear you interrupt your flow a little bit, and which makes me wonder, and this is my assumption, and it is all up to you to either say like, Ghazali, you're wrong, or like, um, yeah, this is, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's some truth in there. It's um, what, I, what I made up in my head was that you actually listen to the English translation um, to see if, it's, if it catches up or if, it, if the um translation is accurate um that's what i make made up in my head because I, I like i watch you as a chair i see you speak and i see your your the motor you know like what what you do and and you see see i hear you slow down a little bit my russian is as good as my chinese so i don't know anything about russian yet um but i hear you like repeat some words sometimes or change a little bit of the tone um, so, which makes me lead to that preliminary observation that you um, uh, um, 
pay attention to the translation. Uh, um, yeah, well, like, I just had to, I had to ask you, is it true or um, am, am I just making this up? No, it's, it's, it's true, it's true. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's not only me, I think so many, many others um, uh, who choose to speak Russian, uh, but understand English uh, uh, too. So they, um, they listen to the interpretation at least half year uh big big uh big because um sometimes it doesn't match as you said and uh you want to be uh accurate so you want that your idea at least what would be uh conveyed to the audience in the right way and and sometimes i forget because sometimes when you get passionate about the the topic so then you just speak um and especially if it's not written down uh somewhere so then you just um don't pay really attention to the translation you you just speak uh, and then somebody tells you that oh why didn't you listen because you you spoke too too far too fast or they mistaken or uh you know some of my colleagues like sometimes like i uh who uh, a tammy or christian who uh, sat in, uh, next to me so they they said that <laughs> what you said didn't make sense in english <laughs> What did you say about? It? So then um, I, I started, um, yeah, after this, so you, you want to be really, really careful and, 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 and accurate because, um, yeah, I, I mean, I understand, that, as I said, my first profession, I'm a linguist and also a translator. So I understand the, the, the role of the job of translator interpreter is very hard, very difficult. Uh, so I would not blame them for misinterpreting something, but uh, but it is also the, the job of of um, uh, of the speaker to, especially like those who don't speak English um, and speak other UN languages, so to to follow at least a little bit. Uh, and at, at this level of English, I probably could speak English as well uh, while in the UN, uh, but I just don't want. Uh, uh, because of, you know, a couple of reasons. So one is that um, still I'm, you know, the the level of sophistication of my speech would be much better in Russian uh, rather than in English uh, because of the need to preserve all six UN official languages in the UN system. Because if everybody would speak English, there, there would no, there would not would be no need for for other languages, which are lingua francas for so many millions of peoples. Um, and, and it is important for my constituency, for the Russian indigenous peoples to, to see and to understand what I'm saying. Uh, so it, it would be, you know, kind of ethically problematic probably if I just uh, switch to English and speak all the time English. And I received this kind of complaints on Facebook when I used to post, um, you know, something on English all the time in English all the time. So then I decided to to post in Russian after those complaints because I should not detach myself from, from the community and uh, from the language that the community is speaking. Um. Yeah. Is um. The, the, yeah. I'm not going to ask that question because I, I know the answer to that. Um. Talking about the, because so, this was a sidestep, obviously, um, the decade on indigenous languages. Um, what, what do you envision uh, about what it, um, what it entails, um, what it can do for indigenous peoples, um, the Fino, uh, Fino Ugric uh, language family, the Karelians, uh, but all the other indigenous peoples around the world? What do you, what do you, what would you like to see uh, come out of it? Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I really want to see uh, that languages, you know, have a chance to survive because the, there is a pessimistic um, forecast uh, by scientists that uh, by the end of this century, uh, many languages, uh, if, you know, at least half of the indigenous languages will, uh, will die. And I don't want to um, 
you know, to be a witness of this uh, process. So that's why we uh, and indigenous peoples say that don't call our, our languages dying languages. So let's just call them either dormant or under-resourced or something, but not dying because it is undermining so much uh, the value and, the, the, and discourages indigenous peoples a lot. Uh, so we, I want to, uh, to see such, you know, that, that the, the international year would help to, uh, to turn around the tendency. Uh, and the tendency is unfortunately not very good. So we, uh, what I see in the Karelian community, for example, it is just the decline, uh, permanent decline uh, from census to census. We see that this, uh, our people um, just choose not to speak Karelian or uh, they don't speak because of historical um, situations and intergenerational trauma or because of the lack of efforts uh, to revitalize and to uh, provide people with opportunities to speak on in different settings, not only at home, uh, but also in, you know, in, in the hospitals, in, uh, in the courts and in the stores and everywhere. Um, and the, 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 the efforts that sometimes we see are very symbolic, just symbolic. So they, they for example, decide to, you know, to um, in, in my city now, it is good, very good, actually. I, I, I have nothing to say against that. Uh, it is something we advocated for like uh, years ago. Uh, they, they just put this bilingual uh, tables on, on um, houses and buildings. Uh, so bilingual meaning that Russian, and uh, uh, Karelian next to it. So th th this is very good. This is a visualization of, of the language. And this is something that, um, that already exists in many other regions here. Uh, but, but this is still symbolic because um, if we look in depth, um, many, I mean, if, if we look at the core, uh, at the root of the problem, it is not there. It is not the toast tables. It is something deeper. Um, and especially like, I mean, my professor says uh, in Colorado um, when he teaches uh, undergrad students, uh, what is the basic point of endangered languages? So what, what endangerment means? Uh, endangerment means that kids no longer speak the language. So the, there is a, uh, a, an intergenerational uh, transmission has interrupted. Uh, and if this is true, and this is probably true, so we have to direct all our efforts to resolving this particular problem, uh, which would mean very serious revitalization measures, uh, language nests, uh, whatever, educational system. But also, um, uh, before that, we have to recognize that the problem exists, that this is the problem, and not uh, to uh, kind of put the rose glasses on, on us and, and, and say that, no, we, we still have a lot of speakers there, but those speakers are aged. So the, 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 the kids don't speak, the families don't use Karelian as a language of, of family conversation. And um, so uh, we have to literally uh, reproduce speakers. And the, 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 I mean, if you look at this experiences like in New Zealand, for example, or Finland, inner, inner community. So they, they managed, they had uh, uh, and still have the same problem. So they managed to increase number of speakers by educating um, preschool kids. And this is the way to go. I think uh, we have to, uh, you know, we, we, we just have one language nest in Karelia. And this is entirely um, because of the efforts of language activists in a particular village. And everybody speaks that this uh, experience must be 
reproduced, transmitted to other villages. But the, um, as we say in Russia, uh, the wagon is still there. So we, we, uh, we just speak, but um, there is not enough uh, we did or we, we have done uh, to move this. Um, to move this forward. So um, yeah, the, the, and uh, as I said before, so it's uh, it's important to have a plan for every single language because Karelian, you know, compared to, um, uh, I mean, Botian language, for example, or uh, Sami language in Russia. So Karelian is, um, one would say that Karelian is uh, in, in a very good position still <laughs> because we have like 45, uh, 45,000 Karelians in, in the Republic of Karelia, and half of them kind of speak Karelian. Uh, th there is no um, very um, e efficient evidence, but but according to census, so what, what we have to operate this data. So uh, half of them can speak at some, some level of speaking. Uh, I assume not all of them uh, who mentioned on the census that they speak, so they speak fluently, probably not. Uh, but many other languages have a much worse situation. Some have um, like a few speakers, tens of speakers, hundreds of speakers. And uh, for every single language, there should be a plan. Uh, what, is, what, is, what is possible to do either to document the language or revitalize it or maintain, main, um, you know, um, contribute to maintenance and um, things like this. And, and the, if, if it's documentation, then what and how it should be done? Should it be uh, by scientific means? So we have to invite scientists, researchers from uh, universities, students, or there should be activists from the community who, who are enthusiasts and who can do this, this thing uh, more, I mean, not, not, not so professionally as the scientists would do, but, but still, or uh, should we use the information communication technology? Uh, should we kind of uh, produce electronic dictionaries? Um, uh, how to say spe spell checkers and um, uh, text uh, recognition systems and so this kind of stuff. Um, and and some people for some communities it's useless because. Uh, when I hear that uh, some NIF, com NIF community in Sakhalin Island, so they, they speak about spell checkers at this point. I mean, I, I'm speechless because, the, I mean, this is good. They think about it, but, but first of all, they have to, uh, the, the, there is no one who, who, who would use them. <laughs> There's just a few speakers there. I mean, uh, they, sh they should do something around uh, revitalization, first of all. Um, uh, and probably documentation, but but spell checkers uh, could be useful at later stage. So the, the, there is no need to just paste and uh, you know copy and paste uh, others' experiences, but it, it could be done wisely uh, with uh, with um, with a plan. So the language planning, I think, uh, should be one of the main goals of this decade. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good educated language planners so we have to educate them as well <laughs> uh, and and that's why i say that uh, there should be a lot of cooperation uh, with um with science with uh universities and one um when i spoke about this uh doubts of indigenous peoples one one doubt was that uh language would shadow other things but other doubt was that uh this international year and and the decade consequently would just um bring benefits for the scientists. So they will raise millions of dollars of grants for their field trips and um, conferences and, and stuff like that. But, but indigenous communities would not really benefit from it. Uh, I think this is a, a rightful doubt and, and um, there should be a, a lot of uh, things to, to be done to avoid it. Uh, and all this, that's why when we speak about multi-trust fund uh, with UNESCO, um, so this multi-trust fund should, should be, should include indigenous peoples and in the governance systems that it should be governed by indigenous peoples. Uh, and, and the scientists as well. So they have to uh, work accordance, 
with the ethics uh, and the ethics say uh, that uh, whatever they find in indigenous communities, they should bring back as well. So they, it's not like they come, just extract things and then they research in their offices and then they produce a paper, uh, get uh, awards and another grant and indigenous communities do not get anything from that. Uh, so they uh, have to bring back knowledge uh, or tools. So something which would be useful uh, for indigenous communities. Is there anything that um, that what the, uh, is happening in the Karelian Republic to um, revitalize or strengthen uh, languages uh, of, of the, the Korean and, and the Fino Ugric um, language? Is there anything that you're doing um, so that I'm asking so that people have an idea? of what they can start with or um, how to look at things in terms of activities to revitalize or make use of the, of the decade of uh, on indigenous languages, aside from language nests, obviously. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. so we, we, have, uh, we have some some good efforts actually. And uh, uh, we, uh, I, was, I was happy to be part of a project that is called SANA, uh, Sana is a uh, word in, uh, in many uh, Baltic Finnish languages, which Karelians, Karelian and other webs and other languages belong to. Uh, so, um, and in, uh, in, the, in the Sana project, the long name was um, something, um, uh, network creation of a, a network uh, to revitalize and safeguard indigenous languages in the Baltic Sea area. And so um, in this project, we looked into uh, three elements. One was capacity building. So we simply wanted to, um, you know, to educate language activists. So there are language activists, but who, who have a lot of energy and you know, passionate about this work, but they uh, sometimes don't want how to, uh, to to move forward and what what they can pick pick on and what is the um, the source of um, uh, psychological um, wellness for these activists because uh, sometimes they have a fatigue from this work and they don't don't feel it's going well and so on. So we um, it's one part of the capacity building. Then another part is financial support because. So we organized the competition and, and, and supported many, many projects with small amounts but um, that our grant uh, allowed for, but um, that the amount was still useful for them. Uh, so they could do some small, small scale projects, um, uh, you know, um, small scale projects in their communities. Uh, and then uh, we also uh, found those topics that are Kind of interesting for indigenous peoples, for example, um, and and which would be interesting also uh, f uh, in terms of um, language learning, for example. Uh, like one one idea was this um, uh, uh, cuisine, so the uh, the food and how to cook and and this kind of stuff. So we organized um, events and courses on video courses on on uh, cooking. Uh, with using the vocabulary uh, that is relevant and, and, and so it is kind of interesting and encouraging. Uh, and um, yeah, I think the, uh, the third element was uh, collecting best practices. So we collected those best practices, published them, and, um, uh, and th these are ready for transmission. So one good practice from not from Karelian community, but from Mordovian community, which is um, southern uh, so south to Moscow, uh, south of Moscow. So uh, and they they still have I think they have like uh, eight hundred thousand Mordovians in in the country. So it's a bigger community, uh, but the language problem is almost the same as Karelian. So the intergenerational transmission is is very poor. Uh, 
So they, um, the two activists that um, one teacher and one, I think another one was, um, or is um, uh, just, uh, uh, a, I mean, like a photographer or something. So they got together and they had an idea to create a movie, first ever uh, movie in that language. Uh, nobody listened to them. Nobody wanted to pay money to this project because um, it seemed like um, too avant-touristic and, and, and so on. Uh, and so they, the, just two of them, so they, you know, un, two roles of director of the movie, uh, producer, um, actor. Uh, so they hired more actors, but they also uh, played the, um, you know, performed as actors and um, they found costumes. And so they, they, did, they did the movie. Um, they spent two years and they did a movie. Uh, and after that, when the government also saw the movie, so they said like, why didn't you ask for money? So they said that we asked for money, but you didn't believe in us. But now they, they thought that, yeah, this is such a great movie. So they, they started to popularize it uh, and, um, and really wanted to participate. Uh, so that was a, another good example. Uh, and in Karelia, in terms of documentation, for instance, so there is a <clears throat> the language institute that um, uh, does collects the all the texts and uh, pro uh, pro produces a language corpus that is important for further um, uh, scientific, uh, but also more practical technical issues, like I said, the spell checkers and language dictionaries and so on. So this is going on, and then uh, somebody, uh, a group of activists, translated um translated the uh, russian social media uh of contact it's uh like a analogous uh, to facebook uh so they translated it, it, its interface into Kyrillian. uh another group started uh with wikipedia in Kyrillian language so there was no wikipedia in Kyrillian. now it's like around uh, a couple of thousands articles in in this language um and uh somebody produced uh cartoon uh, in Karelian. So this kind of things that are important for the youth, um, uh, so they are, I think th this is the way to, to, to go, I think, because uh, when, when the youth sees that this language is not just something their parents spoke or the grandparents spoke, it is something that is, uh, could be used in computer. Um, it could be, um, uh, found on the internet, uh, there is a media source in, in this language, and there is now a, a multi, multi language um, web portal um, that produces original content. And I think, I mean, I, I was advocating for this idea for a long time. So we should not just translate, uh, you know, because there was before, like 10 years ago, I saw this in, in some regions, like in the Mariel Republic, for example. So they translated uh, Russian popular songs into the language and played them on discotheques. And, and so that was good. So the, I mean, I attended some and you know, youth was very good, but it was a temporary effect. Uh, then they kind of, um, you know, so they uh, didn't like that anymore. Uh, and so the idea here is that I mean, in order for the language to be prestigious, it should produce some original content, um, music, um, science, uh, even, you know, newspaper news, whatever, something original that was, would, could not be written or read in another language. So and that's why this idea of a multi-language multi portal was important for us. So we, we wanted that uh, this portal would speak about what is going on in Karelia um, in these languages. Not only because sometimes when you look at the, uh, I'm a, uh, I subscribe um, new, newspaper in Karelian. So it is, um, I mean, Karelian written tradition is not very long. So it was, the alphabet was adopted in 1989. Uh, and, and so the newspaper was established uh, 30 years ago. And when you look at this, so you, you read news 
Um, and everything is about Caribbean language and culture. So you cannot read about, you know, just I, taken from, um, from the top of my head, like uh, criminal news, for example, somebody killed uh, somebody there in a village or um, uh, like something happened in the economy, like economic boom or decline or some regular news that everybody reads in Russian should also exist in this language, in Kralian. And then uh, it would be interesting uh, for, for the reader to to explore and to to open the the, the source of information uh, because it's it's a unique content there. So and and these things are kind of going on, um, not as quickly as one would um, uh, one would hope, uh, but um, they are going and to to this direction. And I think um, what I what I would expect, what I would um, kind of push, uh, push to is, um, uh, how to say, um, you know, double, doubling the effort so that uh, we, we don't have much time, unfortunately, we, we, we should not sometimes the government say, uh, and some people say like, Oh, no, th this is you, you speed up too much. So just slow down a little bit. We, we have to we establish this now, so we, we want to think, see how it works, and then, like in a couple of years, we we come to the point that when we when we have a spell checker, for example, uh, I say like, no, 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 <laughs> we don't have that time. So we, we should really uh, use the opportunity of having uh, still speakers, knowledgeable people, elders, uh, people who know Karelian as a native language, because. Uh, when at this at that point when we have only those who learn the language in school as a second language so then it, it's a different situation then um i want to present that that we're, we're um in terms of languages and everything else we're running out of time as in we need to def definitely double double our efforts um what i gather from the the indigenous world in the, uh, talking to other indigenous peoples, when it comes to the language, they also, um, uh, one of the quote unquote sources of indigenous language or the, the ways of preserving indigenous language is through uh, their songs, um, their traditional songs. Um, how does that fit into this? Like, do, do you see any way of, um, uh, any way of how to manifest that or celebrate that? Um, within the scope of the International Decade on Indigenous Languages? Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's exactly, uh, uh, I think uh, that's very important. So the, the songs is very important here. And we uh, sometimes see uh, uh, our Sami brothers and sisters opening different meetings with their yoiks, uh, traditional songs. And uh, other indigenous peoples. So all all indigenous peoples have uh, songs, and this is part of very important part of their uh, heritage uh, and uh, everyday life. So I I, be, I believe that this is um, this is very important actually. And and in Karelia, um, uh, we currently celebrate um, the international. I mean not the international, but uh, the year. Uh, Republican year of Karelian traditional songs. So this year is declared. Um, and actually we had a UNESCO meeting with, that was a, uh, a meeting for the, for the whole region, uh, Russia, Eastern Europe, Caucasia and so on. Um, we had this meeting and a couple of weeks ago and it was opened by the a, a Karelian traditional song. So uh, I, I think um, and unfortunately, I mean, Karelians also used to have uh, yoiks, especially northern Karelians. So we had yoiks and uh, similar to, to what Sami have, uh, have a little bit different, but a uh, uh, similar idea. Um, unfortunately, this tradition is now disappeared. So it, it, Karelians do not perform yoiks um, anymore. Uh, but um, these other traditional songs that are, they, they're called the runes. 
um, and um, there is um, a whole epic poem that is called Kalevala, epic poem uh, written by um, a Finnish um, uh, writer and doctor Elias Leonrod uh, in, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, so uh, he collected uh, those Karelian songs. Uh, he traveled to Karelia um, and he gathered those runes and then he put them together, modified some of them, uh, created some more. And um, this is how he established the epic poem. So this is not this this epic poem is is uh, equally important for for Finns. It's part of their identity. It's equally important for Karelians because it's based on their traditional heritage. Uh, but so what we celebrate here is the traditional songs uh, uh, that he collected there. So the uh, the Elias Lundot collected. So um, and and these are still alive. Um, unfortunately, not very well uh doing not very, not doing very well but but still alive and i think um uh it is very timely to pay attention now uh to those people who can still you know who, who carry this heritage who can um you know transmit it because through songs it's easier to you know to kind of get the the idea about the culture and um it contains so much different um uh, cultural codes and, and uh, all this men mentality of, of the indigenous people um, that is important that, that it's the songs and, and the language itself they codify uh, all the important information um, about the perception of world uh, by indigenous peoples the um, you know traditional livelihoods the ways uh, how to develop society and, and everything is codified there so i think it's um it's the right it's the right way to do and pursue the language is there um and this is just my observation um the way that you talk about it with a lot of passion and with a lot of insight um do you think that and i also sense that we, sh we should be doing more 100 about about protecting languages um, we have a decade now. Um, what should we do as a movement, as an international Indigenous Peoples Movement? Um, what, uh, yeah, what are the first things that we that, that we should be doing in terms of uh, um, uh, actions? And I, yeah, international level, local level. What, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, maybe also talk talk about um yeah maybe uh, in terms of diplomacy maybe um so that we can make sure that um at the end of this decade that we're not we're we're not even we're not losing languages but we're increasing it at least more um people are more literate about it more speaking about, more about it um basically like we all have seen um previous decades regarding indigenous peoples right um not necessarily a decade with a lot of action learn having learned from the past experiences um how can how can we and i'm looking towards you for, for guidance um how can we make sure that this becomes a decade of action yeah that's a good question and um um so probably there is no um no single uh, simple answer uh, to it. and especially now in how complicated this international diplomacy is, and of course um, there should be like multiple multiple levels um, of um, of action. So there is there are limitations on what can be achieved on the international level, what can be achieved on the national level, and what can be achieved on local community level. So uh, internationally, I think it, it's um, it, um, what is what I mean. What what happened in, during the international year um, is that the international level was the most successful one. 
it's kind of easier for all actors to go to Paris, to go to New York and um, um, support everything uh, and say, uh, you know, express their commitments and, and so on. But it's much harder to, to go back to the constituency and, and start working really. And it's because of the objective reasons sometimes, just the lack of money, lack of resources, lack of, lack of people who can support it, lack of, um, you know, native speakers, uh, lack of psychological resources, mental, mental resources. Uh, because what, what happens in Karelian's language, Karelian languageness, for example, it's hard to find teachers there because some people who, who are native Karelian speakers, but they are used to speak Russian all the time. So the, it's very hard for them to switch. It's very hard to them to, to turn on uh, their Karelian, you know, uh, Karelian speech for the entire day with kids, very difficult. And the, 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 we, um, and those activists who organize it, so they sometimes uh, provide uh, support, like uh, mental support, psychological support to this activist. So it, 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 we, we should, it's very hard um, to, to actually implement, uh, but yeah, something could be still done on the international level too, because uh, I think last year, not two years ago in Vancouver, there was a, a regional meeting for North America and the Arctic. And um, uh, some people spoke about an international, um, international treaty uh, on indigenous languages, for example, uh, that would uh, be uh, a binding document. So uh, governments could uh, join it and then um, integrate and, and develop their laws according to it. So um, I think this idea is not bad but somewhat uh, hardly achievable um, uh, be because states at, at this point probably don't want to take more commitments uh, on indigenous, uh, indigenous people because they have already uh, this uh, declaration on the rights of indigenous people. So uh, they think this is, uh, this is already enough and, um, and, and so on. But um, the, there could be uh, more work done uh, on the international level in terms of standardization. So what is the, so making guidance, uh, making, uh, I mean, even when I say about plans, language planning, so there should be something like a universal document where uh, different, different um, ways of engagement, different ways of uh, different tools could be described. So then uh, one could just pick from there. Uh, so this is good for us, this is good for us. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and then continuous and very serious um, um, awareness raising again. So, it, I mean, because the, there was a good, good work done, but um, still um, not, re not all, all of the regions, you know, are balanced in terms of the, uh, the work on languages. So the, for example, Asia region, Africa region were not very, uh, participative. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there is an evaluation group uh, right now working on 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 a on a document. Um, so they evaluate why what are the particular reasons for this this balance. Uh, but some re some regions like Arctic, for example, North America, they were more uh, more engaged with the international year, and so it's good to have this evaluation so it, we could improve things for the. Uh, for the decade. And I think one of the most fundamental mistakes uh, and, and, and obstacles uh, was um, the lack of engagement with indigenous peoples. Even though UNESCO did a good job, so they wanted to, uh, they, they called on indigenous peoples. So bring names of your representatives to the steering committee and so on. But, but some regions, you know, hardly, um, had you know hardly provided those names, so they had very uh, problematic discussions. I know some, you know, I, I would not name, but some regions really had problematic discussions for the decade. So they they couldn't select easily their representatives, and it's because because of the lack of dialogue uh, and um, because of the lack of uh, and different level of recognition by governments. For example, in, in the US, for the US is not even part of UNESCO anymore. So uh, 
uh, it's not a member state of UNESCO. And that's why uh, some indigenous peoples there think that uh, this is an obstacle for their participation in the, in the international decade. So because their gov the government is not there and this is not right. So they still have the right and they still have an opportunity to participate uh, and they should. And I think right now the process in the US is, is going to a good direction. Um, so, um, and um, so the international level is an encouraging one. So the, uh, the one that provides um, kind of guidance uh, and, and support. And if there will be a multi-trust fund uh, that UNESCO wants to establish, it's for better because uh, resources are lacking. So um, um, there will be a chance to, to support community-based projects from that fund. But the most work, most of the work uh, should be probably done on the national level, on the local level, community level, because uh, as one of the Emory reports uh, on languages say, says um, the, the primarily uh, bearers of the responsibility for the survival of indigenous languages are indigenous peoples themselves. Uh, and this, this, is, this is right. So the, uh, I mean, of course, the states are responsible too because they committed to policies uh, of assimilation. They committed to, um, to, to bad things that happened uh but um uh, right now we should um rely on the commitment and support that they voice in international meetings and make them cooperate on indigenous languages and make them pay um indigenous communities that they uh could really um enforce those revitalization methods that they want and one of the Emory reports also say, says that um, states should spend as much money for the revitalization uh, as was spent uh, for the destruction of indigenous languages, at least, at least that much, but maybe even more. So, um, and it's, it's important, you know, uh, and on the, on the national level, there still could be done a lot of work in terms of legislation. I mean, I can say about, I wrote an article together with um, a Christian carpenter. So we wrote an article on um, languages as a human right. And we elaborated on, on US and Russia uh, situations, did some comparison and so on. And um, it, turned down, it, it, it turned out that, um, for example, in, in Russia, there is a very extensively, you know, very extensive legislation on, on language. Um, there are many laws uh, describing and many regulations uh, that um, help in how to implement the laws and there are regional uh, sub subnational level laws and, and so the many very complicated uh, system. Uh, but the problem here is that sometimes those laws don't work for some reasons. Like one, one example here uh, is um, uh, central uh, Central Election Commission in the Republic of Karelia uh, still uh, doesn't want to print uh, ballots in the Karelian language, despite the despite the, the law, the federal law says that it is a it is a possibility. It is required if indigenous peoples request that in the in the territories of the traditional uh, residents. And the Central Election Commission simply says, so we do not, we will not do that because there is no list, officially approved list of, uh, you know, areas of traditional residence of Karelians, for instance. <laughs> but this is, I mean, uh, um, this is ridiculous because uh, first of all, uh, that federal law uh, doesn't, require that kind of list uh, and many other republics print the ballots that's not a problem um, and another thing is that there is a list actually there is a list that the Korean government has produced and there is a whole set of different settlements uh, where Koreans live so this is this is just a common knowledge everybody knows that 
And if 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 the Central Election Commission doesn't know, so they could request, for example, the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences or the the Fed the Republican agency that works with indigenous affairs um, to produce such a list if they need it. So uh, one example how a, a well set law doesn't work. And there are many, many other examples like that. So, and, and there could be a lot of work to be done uh, in terms of improving it. Um, and on indigenous level, the, the most important level, I think. Um, uh, so, in Karelia, many uh, the scientific uh, reports and the question, you know, the, there were some uh, surveys on perception of of parents, um, indigenous parents on of their languages uh, and how whether they want their kids to speak the languages so like almost all said that yes uh, language is a priority so they want kids to speak the uh, native language uh, and one interesting fact that in their hopes they kind of rely on the educational system so they think that the the, the educational system that is controlled 100 percent controlled by the government and it's very seriously regulated by all the standards and federal standards. And it's like uh, top-down regulation from the Moscow uh, authorities. So it, it is very centralized, this uh, educational system. Uh, so they believe that this system uh, is a key uh, to, to support and uh, to safeguard indigenous languages. And uh, the reality is that uh, when we look at what is going on in the schools, so my daughter, for example, uh, uh, is in a class where, where they, you know, um, they teach um, uh, Karelian and Finnish, and this is not enough. Uh, this is not enough. So the uh, uh, the methodology, uh, even if methodology is good, but but just the time uh, they allocate for these uh, lessons is not enough, especially. Um, especially if it's not supported by another environment somehow. Uh, when kids go out of school and they don't come across Karelian anywhere, uh, so uh, it's useless. So they're not encouraged to, to learn it. Uh, and another thing is that, <clears throat> yeah, so, but, but still the educational system is important. This is probably their, the hopes of the parents are rightful uh, because it is such a powerful system. So they have such a, a big influence on, on kids. And if it would be set in a different way, um, so language would dominate there or language would, uh, would be prominent there. So then it could be more helpful. But, but um, this educational system could also rely on, on the support of indigenous people. So they could invite elders, they could invite indigenous writers, musicians, uh, poets, and, and other act, and activists, those who are passionate about language. So they interact with the kids and, uh, and that could be um, kind of uh, useful uh, for, the, uh, for, 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 the, for the language, for the preservation. So um, th this kind of things, and, and I believe that um, um, this international decade will help to, um, you know, to guide and to, to improve and, and so on <clears throat> yeah th thanks uh thanks for that so um outlining um uh, what you what you see what you want to see and what should happen that's not just on the at the international level but uh, national as well as the indigenous level and the local level um that we also um uh yeah put the decade into action so that it becomes an uh, um a um yeah actionable decade um so that we actually have something that's um something improved at the, at the end of it um obviously it's just a kickoff uh, um after the decade because we need to continue um, um protecting and preserving and maintaining and transmitting um our, our languages um let's say something else if i may um that was also super interesting you were involved, you, you are involved with the Decade for Indigenous Languages. Um, you also alluded to, well, well you also said you, you, you wrote a paper on it. Um, 
uh, on on indigenous languages. So I'll definitely put the link in the show notes so that people can can read up on it. Another paper that you uh, pr um, produced, same authors yourself and Kristen Kompner, um, Indigenous Peoples and Diplomacy at the at the world stage, I believe, um, recently published. What you used, one of the examples that you used in that in that paper was something that I believe you were one of the um, key drivers in this, in this, and what, which is repatriation of cultural objects of, of, of indigenous peoples. Um, and you highlighted the, uh, the Masakova of, of the Yaki indigenous nation um, that was now, I believe in Sweden, um, that, of, um, the, in a museum. Um, yeah, for, for people for people that don't know don't know about that um, about that case, um, yeah, could you please explain that a little bit and what actually repat repatriation of cultural objects means as well? I think that is super super interesting as well. Yeah, I think this um, this example is really uh, a, a fascinating one, um, uh, and. And potentially, so it, it has a lot of potential to um, uh, to improve the whole situation with um, international repatriation of, of uh, indigenous people's cultural objects and human remains, uh, if it will be successful. And there, there are some indications that it, it, it possibly will. Um, so after uh, years of advocacy and I think I mean I was involved in this um, by um, Andrea Carmen so Andre, Andrea Carmen um, uh, from um, the International Indian Treaty Council so she um, is she pursues this topic uh, for, for a long time and um, so this Masakova is um, a sacred uh, object of the Yaki people, uh, a reindeer head uh, that was uh, suppos supposedly um, illegally taken or stolen, um, and uh, it ended up um, in uh, in the Museum of the World Culture in Sweden. Um, and but the Yaki people, uh, of course, want this object to be uh, brought back to their community. Uh, because this is they, they feel that this is a living being. This is not just a, a, a reindeer herd. It's a, it's a living being that is important for them for their ceremonies, uh, and um, and so they demanded this uh, this back. Uh, but but Sweden um, and the museum, so they uh, were reluctant to the idea of repatriation, uh, referring to the. Uh, to the law, uh, international law uh, that was not applicable in this in this case, and also they referred that to their records that this uh, object was uh, acquired, um, you know, um, rightfully. So it, it was acquired um, by permission, and um, so uh, they they thought it it was legally possessed by by the museum. So. Um, Anyways, I mean, um, I would not go to the details of the uh, of the legality uh, of of this this thing, but um, the trend, and that trend was discussed very well uh, last year at the, um, at the conference at the seminar in in, Brit in the University of British Columbia uh, in Canada, um, where it was very well voiced by the um, uh, representative of the museum community, I think the national museum community. So she spoke, sp she, she spoke about the human rights approach in repatriation. So she spoke about the need uh, to make, to do things differently because museums are pretty conservative uh, institutions. So they do not want their collections to be destroyed. They want to possess whatever they have and they really uh, don't want to say goodbye to every single thing they have, even though if those things are not even exhibited, even if they just possess them and they are in the storage. 
and which is actually the case with Masakova. So they just don't want to make a precedent. Uh, oh, and and especially in Sweden, so uh, they no, we, a Zemrib, so we got the request from um, when I was there. So we, we, uh, Christian and I so Colette on this request, and um, the request was from uh, first from the, in the in International Indian Treaty Council. Uh, we directed this to Sweden, and it turned out that Sw the Swedish government said that uh, this is not. So we cannot do anything here because it is the museum uh, who can decide. So museum has the authority. So we turned to the museum. Museum was not very um, uh, kind of open to the discussion at that point. Uh, and then there was a, a, a conversation behind the scene and the like exchange of multiple emails and so on. Uh, and it, so it turned out that, the, that there was no fundamental understanding on, on all sides uh, of, you know, of what is possible, what is not possible. So, and that's why they were stuck. So the Yakis, they, they just wanted it back. So they said that no, no matter how, so just give it back because this is the declaration. Declaration says that these objects must be returned. And the Swedish museum says that, you know, we have the knowledge that this is acquired rightfully and this is um uh, so there is no international law that requires us to you know to give it to you uh, who are you so <laughs> well, what are what is the party that would receive it actually uh would it be uh mexico uh, a state of mexico or would it be united states uh would it be um international indian treaty council and and in fact, uh, it uh, it belonged to the Kalencias, the cultural societies. It's not even, you know, um, governing authority of the Yaki people. And so we, we had to establish, or we, we um, I mean, it triggered this whole conversation. Triggered a lot of good processes in the Yaki community. So they uh, it made it made them um, establish. A cross border, they already had something, but they in, uh, kind of boosted it. So, it, uh, uh, the cross border cooperation uh, and establishment of a Masakova committee that, um, you know, helped to kind of mitigate the situation inside because the more we, the deeper we went, the more reference to possible misunderstanding within the Yaki community, possible, it's like, you know, this principle of uh, divide tempera, um, divide and rule. So uh, attempts to, there were some attempts to kind of destroy, uh, show that there is no common understanding among the Yakis themselves about this object. <laughs> uh, and and um, Emery Troll and, um, exp you know, my, my role and others role uh, was to kind of help um, um, Yakis to, you know, make a good case about it. So to, re, you know, enforce cooperation, um, eradicate all the problems and issues that could arise um, and become uh, one, you know, monolith um, counterpart on the table. And so they did. So they, they they did a very good job. They um, they were very responsive to Emrep's request and and so on. And and, and I think um, and the, the conversation was still painful. So I, I was not part of it. I just know that uh, it was not very easy um, with with the museum. And um, it was emotional as well. And and everything everybody like um, perceived this very personally somehow like a museum director and and the yaki leaders and uh it was so emotional uh, and I, I can just imagine how the the negotiation itself was emotional uh but i'm happy for the outcome uh the outcome is good and uh finally there is a uh, an agreement to 
to move forward with the with the case. And I think that's right because um, I mean, museums are conservative, as I said, but uh, but the trend has changed, and everything is now uh, accepting the idea of human rights based approach and and um, um, all even most conservative um, organizations institutions uh, start to follow this trend. Even French president, you know, French president, uh, not this but for this one, I don't know, it might be former president, uh, um, decided to repatriate many objects to Africa to former colonies uh, from museums. Finnish president, uh, I remember it was just before this, when we when we wrote these papers in Emory, uh, uh, so we wrote about this too. The Finnish president came to meet Donald Trump in, in, in the US uh, and he, uh, brought um, uh, an object that was in Finland but belonged to indigenous communities in 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 the U.S. Hopi people, I think, or I remember if I remember correctly. Uh, but anyways, uh, there are domestic good domestic examples in Finland, for example. Uh, they repatriated um, many objects from the capital and other museums to inner community. Uh, to to the Sami homeland, and so they established this muse amazing museum. That they, I think they go going to rebuild it uh, and reestablish an exhibition because because they need more space. So they repatriate everything. So they they now need more space. Um, so there are so good examples, and and it was uh, it it is right that museums do these steps, but sometimes they even if they want, sometimes museums do it proactively. Um, not in this particular case, but there are examples. Uh, but um, the problem is that the, the international law is not developed in this in this sense. There is this 1970 convention um, that um, that is in place, but it is not uh, about indigenous peoples. It, in some cases, it is applicable, but in not in, not in all cases. Um, and and that's why we spoke about. Um, the possibility to build on this building on this case to establish uh, a mechanism or an, an instrument, a treaty maybe uh, on international repatriation of indigenous people's sacred objects and human remains. And I think um, uh, we spoke about me like um, I mean that meeting uh, meeting in in British Columbia uh, was one one good step forward. But I think there need to be um, more there need to be a um, continuation of, of this of this uh, dialogue so um, uh, UNESCO would participate in it WIPO uh, UN itself so others uh, indigenous peoples of course uh, uh, and jointly there could be a, a, a good result yeah it, it is what I really liked about um, and from an outsider point of view, uh, I have not been uh, actively participating. I'm just um, an um, observer of, of the process. Um, two things that I really loved about this uh, this, this case. One, uh, obviously, that you already mentioned is that um, um, that the expert members uh, show up as um, uh, so. There's, there's, there's a dispute uh, between the, like the, the museum and the Yaki people and the, the and um, yeah the, 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 the statement or the, they, they approached the, the, um, the expert members or and you got you, you yourself and Kristen Carpenter, um, North American Rep for um, helped out. And, and I, I love that dynamic and all the, the all right, we, we tried something. It's not working. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk to the expert mechanism and seek advice or seek help. And I think that is something that, 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 that is something that we should model or in a way try to uh, reproduce that um, in, in, in almost all cases uh, for these peoples. Mm -hmm. The second thing, what I loved about it was, um, I remember, I think it was a couple of years ago at the expert mechanism that the president of the summary parliament in Sweden addressed the session 
um, in support of the, the Yaki, uh, Yaki Nation, uh, the Masakova. So there's this solidarity of the, that was going on. So obviously, and I keep repeating this, time is gold for indigenous peoples at the, at the, at the United Nations. Um, for an a, a indigenous delegation to speak um, on, on a topic that concerns other indigenous peoples halfway around the globe, um, I love that so the, that solidarity and and maybe that's this this, um, this my ideal view of 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 how uh, we should be um, how we should deploy our diplomacies indigenous diplomacies at, at the United Nations more in terms of overlap solidarity and and, and those kind of those kind of things um, something that that, that I'm, I'm curious about um, cultural sacred objects of indigenous peoples you've been super invo um, involved in that. Um, is there a, yeah, what is something about cultural rights that you want people to know uh, and, and that, that you uh, learn maybe um, through this process, um, maybe linkages with other rights? Um, what is it something that you would like to, 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 to um, share with people uh, about, about this? Yeah, so I um, really, uh, um, I think, I mean, I really want people to understand that cultural rights is not, sometimes they are, uh, like many people understand that cultural rights are just uh, rights to perform, uh, sing songs and uh, have uh, festivals. Um, and this is what some governments want to, organize all the time saying that so we are here we are contributing to the realization of the cultural rights of indigenous peoples just you know giving money for dances and all these ceremonies and so on uh, but this is not only that it is much more so cultural cultural rights as you said all these link interlinkages so the the i mean cultural rights are almost linked to to everything so when we speak about uh, Sami parliament or when we speak about other uh, governing institutions of indigenous peoples, this is also about cultural rights because this is part of their culture. Uh, this is part of their heritage to have the own, those own traditional bodies uh, and, uh, and own systems to resolve internal conflicts, issues, uh, and, and so on. When we speak about food uh, and access to biological resources, the uh, fish, for example. So we, we also speak about culture because this is their culture. Uh, they can, this is not just because they want to, to eat the fish. Uh, this is because this is part of the culture. Uh, they, they cannot survive without it. So they will simply die, not to hunger, uh, but to the lack of culture, uh, to the lack of uh, access to their, to, to something that was transmitted and preserved by generations of, uh, of their predecessors. Uh, so um, when, when we speak about, um, even when we, we speak about health, for example, it's also about culture. So we, we cannot speak about health without uh, thinking how to preserve um, language and culture, because I mean the very simple interlinkages. Uh, those communities are healthier, and it is proved by scientists uh, where people can easily speak uh, their own language, and those communities are less healthier uh, where they suffer from the lack of language or culture. So um, it is. Um, it is important, like when we speak about, um, for example, extractives and and um, uh, and land rights. Uh, so uh, it is in Russia, for example. I, I know one. Uh, we had a seminar on the on the right to health one time, and uh, there was a, a very a very good speaker. She's not indigenous, but she start, uh, and she's a good friend of indigenous peoples, uh, Natalia Novikova, uh, from the Russian Academy of Sciences. She's an, an anthropologist. And she went to so many uh, indigenous communities and wrote books 
uh, about uh, relationships between extractive industries and indigenous peoples. And, and she said that, um, that uh, extractive industries, they destroy uh, culture, they destroy language uh, because they impose uh, something that is alien to indigenous culture. And they encourage indigenous peoples because some extractors, so they employ, uh, they provide employment for indigenous peoples. So pe indigenous peoples go um, from their indigenous communities to those places. They work for oil gas companies and they earn money, but they're not happy. And this is because they are detached from their land. They're detached from their culture uh, and from their language. So um, this is, um, this all, all things uh, must be considered as one, as, uh, uh, as part of one um, set of human rights. So I, I, I believe that, um, uh, and th this is the message when I, when I you know, meet students, for example, or something. So I am trying to explain the, the interlinkages because everything is written in the declaration is linked to each other. We cannot just implement one article without implementing another one. It's impossible. I 100% agree that um, we, yeah, indigenous peoples and non-indigenous peoples as well, um, when we interpret the declaration, we should interpret and implement it um, objectively as, as a whole, because everything is, um, the way that I see the declaration is the way that Indian people see the world. Everything is connected. Um, and I think um, we should su be super aware of that. And maybe it's intentional, unintentional. Um, I'd like to think that it's intentional that the drafters uh, of the, the Indian people that were involved with the declaration, that they, um, yeah, would want to see the declaration be a, um, a translation of how of our worldview. Um, so everything is interdependent, inter, um, um, interrelated, indivisible, and um, yeah, like look at it from a holistic, objective point of view. Um, so I very much agree with you on that, and that we, um, as as a movement, um, and you you have an up unique podium um, to do that. Um, and by unique, I mean um, all. Dude, you're like you, the greatest hits. You, you've been through the, the fellowship program. Um, MRIP member, MRIP chair, and, and dare I say, MRIP chair during a, a, a moment that it was transitioning from mandate, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's also a, a, a very impo important moment. Um, Masakova, um, Ninja's language is now a uh, per inform member. I'm curious. I'm curious, you, you've seen, you have the mileage to, to know, like you've been through the motions, you've been through the works. Um, when we talk about diplomacy, you know, and um, any innovations, practices that you use or would like Indigenous peoples to use more um, in terms of at the end of the day, Indigenous peoples, while we're at the UN, is try to balance the power balance. And I like to be work with states and partnership and everything else. Um, anything that um, maybe thoughts, maybe not ideas, but thoughts. Like, are, are we are we going the right direction? Should we be we be more innovative? What are your observations on that? Yeah, no, I think um, uh, so I'm, I'm I'm pretty. Um, pretty fresh still um, and also learning a lot because uh, I, I don't I, I cannot call myself as a as a great diplomat uh, or something like this but um, I, I've seen moments um, like very difficult moments in terms of diplomacy uh, even in Emory when Emory Emory before Emory Monday it was changed we had pretty pretty um, um, I don't know how to say it. Uh, we didn't have teeth uh, and tools how to to work. So we just you know did studies and uh, provided space for uh, statements and uh, conversations. 
uh, and we, we interacted with the Human Rights Council, that was uh, important. Uh, but then uh, we couldn't even choose a topic for our study. So there was the, the last say was by states. And so we sometimes had a very um, tough conversation with um, ambassadors there um, who imposed something we didn't want to do. And, and we had to, um, to negotiate and go around and uh, the solution and so on. So that, that, was, um, that was not easy. Uh, but what, what I like about the, the movement uh, that it doesn't, um, and this indigenous diplomacy, it, 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 it is not a short ter term, right? It's, um, it doesn't require uh, short term solutions. And, that, and, and probably it's not even possible for this kind of movement it, it, to have such very straightforward and, uh, and um, uh, and very uh, quick, quick solutions. So um, the the I mean um, I think I was at a graduation ceremony one time uh, with the Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies in the University of Colorado, where um, Dean Anaya, uh, former special rapporteur, presented, and, and he said something uh, like indigenous movement achieved what, what it achieved because it's one of the most dynamic and um, accomplished movements in the world. And, and, uh, and uh, so he said, well, I don't remember the whole speech, but one of the, um, one of the features he underlined was persistence. And I think that's, um, that's, really, uh, that's really true. So uh, without that probably couldn't be achieved so much, but also flexibility uh, and, and diplomacy. So indigenous peoples used to live, um, even one indigenous people can live in many countries, like the Sami people, for example, there are many other examples uh, of people living across the borders. And this, this fact make out of them good diplomats. So they, they know, they, they, they are forced to deal with different countries, with different governments, with different people. And this makes them flexible, uh, but also principles. So they know what they want. Uh, and they always, always should, should, should keep in mind, um, we, we, we always should keep in mind what we want at the end of the day, uh, even though if today it's not possible. So we have to, um, you know, to think, how we possibly achieve it uh, at the end. Like this Masakova case is a good example. So, uh, you know, given all these obstacles and um, discouragements and uh, bad mood probably by the leaders, because nothing, nothing helped for many years. And then suddenly, um, not suddenly, but because of this uh, many years of advocacy, it finally happened. And the same with the declaration, right? So you know it uh, much better than me. It was like 30 years of advocacy before it was possible to achieve. So, um, and I believe WIPO, uh, after tens of years of advocacy, it, it will possibly be achieved at some point, uh, I hope. So, uh, and, and it will not be achieved if indigenous peoples will not be there. So I, I remember one time, um, uh, Kenneth Deer said uh, in a meeting somewhere uh, in Geneva that um, uh, we always must be there at the table because otherwise others will speak on our behalf. So this is this is right. So we, and this pandemic is is especially uh, especially bad because uh, it made uh, many processes exclusive for indigenous peoples, right? Because states still have a chance to to have conversations. So they use technology. They they uh, uh, they, you know, they have a conversation, but indigenous peoples are not there. Uh, and uh, in, in Karelia also, we, we haven't had a meeting of our council of representatives of indigenous peoples under the head of the, of the Republic because, because of the restrictions, even though all the restrictions are already lifted, uh, except for masks in Karelia, but they still refer to this uh, old rules, old, you know, uh, rules that they wrote a year ago and just 
because they don't want to meet us, <laughs> I think. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, so the, as you always say, and as others say, um, we, we should also always be um, at the table discussing and um, really, you know, having, having um, in, in, uh, and, and also like, I think I, I like it very much about indigenous people's diplomacy. It's the, the modesty, the, the very humble, the modest, um, not ambitious because the only ambition here is to achieve the long-term goals that indigenous people's rights are uh, implemented and the indigenous people's interests are heard. And so they are listened to, and they, you know, they are, uh, their consent is obtained in 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 those cases where the, it should be obtained. Um, yeah, and if if for, for these reasons, it should be, uh, we should be modest. That's 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 good. I remember um, when I was Emirate chair actually, uh, and it was a, an event. Um, um six years ago in geneva to discuss the new man mandate the review um i was invited to the so u.s ambassador uh to the human rights council uh invited some experts and indigenous leaders to to his residency uh and at the same time i think um it it was another meeting uh, which was earlier Kind of said earlier uh, at the Quaker's house. Uh, so there was a bigger group of people, uh, state representatives, but lower level, no ambassador, just technical, you know, level people, I mean, secretaries and, and so on. And, and so I had these two conflicting invitations. <laughs> and I decided to go to the Quaker house because, uh, because I think. Um, it was more important to, you know, to speak to larger audience, to speak to all the states uh, that took the time to come. Uh, and of course, probably it was more prestigious to go there to the US ambassador uh, meeting and some people went, uh, but I, I, I decided to, to do differently because I think um, one should be modest, uh, modest enough to, to approach, uh, you know, larger audiences and and then um show that you know you are not just flying in the skies but but you are here on the ground to speak uh and resolve and listen so um yeah i i, I mean I, I, as i said i i'm still learning I, I want to learn more uh from those more experienced um yeah, uh, love you. Love your um, humility. Um, uh, you, you're uh, you're super humble. Um, you you like I said, you know, you you, you have the mileage mileage to, to know. So people also looking up to you, and and you also um, yeah say that you would like to know know more, learn more, and same with me. Um, um, also would, would love to learn more. Is there anything that um? makes you go hmm uh oh um this is uh this could can be a challenge or this could, could be an issue when you when you think about indigenous diplomacies um and it can be across the board um um, um can be the uh tension between indigenous peoples and states internally as well you can be very blunt you can be very honest because we have to learn about 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 ourselves we have to learn um, is there anything that makes you go like, hmm, um, I want you to be aware of this um, so that we can learn from it so that we can improve? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it is, it is, um, there are many difficult difficulties, like in, even like if we take the permanent forum example, uh, it has um, 16 members. Uh, and half are, I mean, all of them should be independent experts, uh, but half of them are nominated by governments, another half by indigenous peoples, and and sometimes uh, it is 
uh, when you, sometimes you see that some of your colleagues are not very independent because um, because it's hard, for, especially for state representatives, to abstract themselves from those who nominated. And as it is for indigenous peoples representatives, but if you represent indigenous peoples, uh, it is very difficult to to think or try to think uh, like how states think. So uh, it, it's hard to you know to stand in the in the uh, in the shoes of uh, an opposite party. Uh, so. Um, and we before so we had last year we had the, a meeting uh, like a, a first meeting of the new composition new membership of the permanent forum because many members changed and so on so um and we discussed we had a huge discussion i think all the members like when they changed they discuss it over and over and over again uh, what is consensus because consensus is the governing principle of the, the permanent forum so what is consensus actually? And we wrote uh, <laughs> a definition that is applicable for our group, and and so it was like interesting, um, interesting definition. Um, so consensus is something that all are equally happy or unhappy about. <laughs> so consensus doesn't provide for uh for a long-term solution because it, it it doesn't go deep to the roots uh it doesn't resolve the the, the, the core problem it is just a temporary um kind of um decision right and um i i, I like very much this unitar trainings that i also attended first as a trainee and then as a, a resource person uh so um, the, they they teach how to resolve problems based on the uh, not on consensus basis, but basing on the, you know, looking deep in the core, in the root, root problems, uh, and trying to, you know, to negotiate uh, in such a way that you would, uh, you know, take, listen first to others, and then um, uh, understand what is their basic interest. So sometimes. Uh, sometimes what people articulate is not their basic interest. It is, uh, it is their fears, or they they think this is important, but the, the root problem is different. And when you reach out to this room to this root, so then you you can uh, propose a different solution probably. So I, I believe that um, this kind of training is very good for for four members, for example. So and Unitar provided uh, trainings for the first membership, uh, but then it was just one experience, and, and uh, I think it's it's um, it's unfortunate. So there should be UN should provide this uh, this kind of trainings for for the for the experts of of these collective bodies because in collective bodies people have to deal with them with with, with colleagues uh, for a long period of time, relatively long, um, and and good relationships are very important. So if you don't have good relationships, then um, then you cannot really achieve anything. So you, you will just have an argument all the time. So, and I, I, I believe that um, this consensus uh, is, um, consensus principle is not the ideal one, uh, absolutely not, uh, but it is uh, something that that is possible to work with, but but what we should really work with is this um, um, root cause uh, extraction and, and resolution um, uh, based on the root cause. Yeah, I I, I love it. Um, as in, I I love the, how you framed consensus as in, as in like the general understanding of it. And also like that it's, it's, it's finite and like it, it is, it only, it's the lowest hanging fruit, it's picking the lowest hanging fruit, whereas you don't address the source of the problem, which is where we, where you, people like yourself are expert members to address the source of the problem and, and, and try to mitigate that or like provide a solution for that. Mm. Um, 
yeah, I think, think that is uh, something that um, a lot of people should know and, and should learn as well about. And you, you mentioned UNITAR training. Um, I did UNITAR pre-decoration. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that was, uh, I was, I don't know, I, I was a young kid back then. Um, so um, um, I was, I was, it was intense for, for me. Would love to do it again um, now that I'm <laughs> a little bit older. Um, and I would highly recommend people to 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 uh, both the fellowship and also do the, the unitar training. It really, it can really um, add to your um, toolkit, I would say, in terms yeah. in terms of um, diplomacy uh, and advocacy. Um, what is um, super in interesting to to me is also uh, um, what. Alex, Alexei Tsikarev, the person, you, um, what is your um, goal? What, what would you like to achieve? Can be personal uh, or personal, uh, professional. Like what would you like to see? Let's say Alexei Tsikarev in, in 10 years, what would you like to have uh, achieved apart from the decade off, obviously? Mm. <laughs> yes. So I, um, uh, I want to do... I want to do a PhD program. Um, I want to contribute because I think, I mean, I, was, I approached PhD uh, before, so after, straight after the university, I uh, applied uh, for one PhD program in Russia, in the Russian Academy of Sciences. And, and then I escaped after one year because I decided that this is too hard. And uh, so I want to do something more practical. Then um, in two years, my professor convinced me to apply again, and I applied and went through. And, and so uh, and, and after a year already, uh, once again, I um, uh, dropped. Um, and I think it was just because I, I was not prepared and, and, and was, not, not, was not enough knowledgeable. I mean, some people do PhD straight after the graduation, so that's fine. Uh, but it's individual, so not in my case, probably. So now I decided that uh, I have some experience to share with others. And, and so I want to describe, I want to contribute to the topic, not only um, from the position of, um, uh, of an expert on, at the UN, like uh, lobbying and so on, but also to sit down and, this, and, and, try, and try down things and maybe philosophize and theorize, theorize on, 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 on the topics that um, I have approached practically. So um, this is one, one goal. I don't know in, whether I will uh, accomplish it, but I started uh, a PhD uh, program this last year uh, remotely, unfortunately, because of the pandemic and, and the visa restrictions and so on. Uh, but th this is something I, 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 I like to write. I, what, I, what I discovered uh, lately that I, I write to, it is, it is very rare for me to, to have a moment to write, but, um, but I like to write uh, when I have a moment. So it's very like your brain starts working uh, intensively. And um, uh, I like this um, as much as I like also the conversations with um, Real, really smart people. Um, like, I, I, I feel, I think I'm really a lucky person because um, people like Albert Barume, uh, Kristen Carpenter, um, Megan Davis. So th this super educated, uh, smart people uh, that surround me at the United Nations. Um, it is just. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, I mean, a, a, a very good luck to, to have the opportunity to to talk with them, uh, and I want to kind of be like them. So uh, I don't know uh, to reach the level of um, uh, of uh, of knowledge. Uh, so th this is why I want to pursue pursue the. Um, uh, the PhD program. Another idea, another goal, maybe um, 
not even like less achievable even to learn another language. So <laughs> I, I I haven't. I mean, I I, I want to learn many languages, but um, Spanish is one, for example. Uh, so I want to improve my Karelian knowledge. I want to. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe two is enough, but. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it, it would be good. So especially uh, if I wanna do some more UN work, uh, so it's good to 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 speak other UN languages because it is not enough for me because the Spanish, I mean, Spanish-speaking indigenous peoples, it's a big part of the world, and uh, uh, you cannot deal with them without interpretation, and that's a, a, a pity. It's a very unfortunate. So I wanna. Uh, speak with them directly uh, and and learn from them. So um, that's one thing. And and then um, in terms of the in terms of the UN. So I um, in the UN it's very important to to understand what is your achievable uh, goals. So I kind of had some some goals. I achieved some. Um, uh, then now I I. I, I don't want to say have a crisis of, of, of goals, but um, it is like like this. So uh, after the international decade, it's hard to you know to to set a, another ambitious idea. Uh, so I last year um, because all four members have the opportunity to to propose a topic and then um, uh, write a study on this topic if others approve the topic so i propose this topic on on indigenous self-governance institutions in, in russia and eastern europe so um and that was a, a good um good writing uh, another writing exercise so i did it uh together with my other two colleagues sven eric sosar and, and Grigory lukiansov uh so and i think um um in the permanent forum I, I, I'm not sure if I will have another term. At, I, I'm dealing now with this particular term that is this year or next year. Uh, so I want to do something that people can touch, something um, uh, that that is uh, possible to evaluate, not just speaking uh, and lobbying something amorphous, but I want to do something uh, that could impact future decision making and and i i don't know what so i and that's why maybe i need uh, some more interaction with indigenous people so i want to to know from them how i could be useful there because i'm not just one person uh, who represents himself in my case so i i want to do it in close collaboration with others and with indigenous peoples and so on and in, so diplomacy is something which um uh which i was passionate about from the childhood so i i looked at this i mean at the russian diplomats that present like i watched tv uh tv news and so the uh how they argue there in the general assembly and uh what is the security council and and so on and so forth but then in Russia, it is, I mean, in many countries, but in Russia, especially it is uh, the, the diplomatic uh, school, the diplomatic um, position is very prestigious. And from Soviet times, it is like a caste. So you, uh, once you get there, so then your kids are there, your grandkids and so on. And so it's, it's not like for, extern for externals, it is very hard to, to come and be, to become members of that uh, that caste, um, even though there are some exceptions of so people from universities other than Moscow University of um, International Affairs also can join foreign ministry. But but now I found this because I mean um, I'm not a diplomat uh, in a sense in a, in a traditional sense, uh, but somehow I'm an indigenous diplomat, and this multilateral indigenous diplomacy is so interesting so it is so encouraging and i want to somehow be there and develop as part of it 
uh, and help and, and, you know, and raise my skills, professional skills uh, uh, and contribute to, to the development of this sphere because I think it's a rising uh, sphere. It, it is uh, indigenous diplomacy uh, and multilateral, multilateral diplomacy is a rising um, uh, kind of sphere. So I think um, it, it, I, I, I would see myself there in 10 years. I don't know in, in what kind of position, but um, definitely um, I, I probably can, can find my, my way there uh, and, and be helpful. Yeah, well, hearing you talk uh, throughout the episode, like, what, what, is there any consideration of, or that might be intriguing to you, um, special rapporteur, or even uh, extra member of the civil and uh, the Committee on Civil and Political Rights? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, so I, um, as I said, I want to be uh, modest and um, I, I'm not sure about this kind of position. So I think the special rapporteur position is, is so important. So it is um, such a, a, a a prominent position uh, and uh, indigenous peoples. I, I remember when we had this conversation about Emory Mandate re Review. So uh, there was a, a, an idea by US to merge uh, the special rapporteur and Emory. And then everybody was like, what is, <laughs> what is going on? So we should not lose this uh, special rapporteur position because it's such an important one. Uh, and I think um, one should be absolutely um, professional and absolutely respected by all in order to become a special rapporteur. So, um, uh, yeah, I, be I believe that, I, I also believe that uh, all regions and representatives from all regions should have a chance to, to be special rapporteur. So I advocate so much, for example, that once I mean, one time, um, uh, like in 10 years, for example, uh, one, a person from, from my region should be a, a chair of, of, of the permanent forum at some point. I'm not saying that this is me or somebody else, but, but at some point, I think it's, it's needed. Uh, and it's not fear that um, so far after 12, 20 years of the permanent forum, nobody from this region uh, you know, has been a, a, a chair of, of this body. So I think um, at some point it should be. Um, and, and this is also a very important position. That's why um, I, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't know whether I, I'm already um, in a position to, to apply or in a position to be there as the face of this global platform, very important platform. So, but, but the committee, you said the committee on um, the treaty bodies, right? So the, the committee, human rights committee or committee on social economic uh, rights. Uh, I think that would be interesting for me at some point. Yes, because uh, yeah, but, but I don't know because it's state, it's states who nominate people there. So it is kind of um, um, uh, another side of, <laughs> so, but who knows, yeah. Yeah, def definitely. Who knows? And uh, like, if you look at it right now, like um, in terms of treaty bodies, there's, according to my knowledge, um, the current special rapporteur was the last one, the last member of, uh, and probably also the yeah. only member uh, in the, in the treaty bodies that's indigenous. Um, so yeah, we we do uh, we could use some help. Um, and I'm not saying that it should be you, um, but like it's. Um, um, yeah, if you thought about it or considered it at some point. Um, it, it, it sounds logical to me, not that you have to do it, but um, I can imagine that, that you, you thought about it at some point. Um, knowing that we, we were um, coming to the, the, the to running out of time um, and I don't wanna um, um, yeah, take too much of your time because I've already, you've blessed this whole conversation already with, with, with um, several hours. Um, some some f final rapid fire final questions, is that that's okay with you? Yeah. Um, so yeah, just easy questions. Um, well, hold on. You you, you talked about um, 
um, a potential role, leadership role for, for the Western region, um, be it the Prim Forum, for example. What is the, is there a, uh, what is the misconception about the Russian indigenous region that people have? Um, so, um, I, I think that um, it is, uh, you, you mean the misconception, is, uh, like why um, indigenous leaders from this region are not like featured as leaders in the global organizations? Or? Yeah, could, could be. Um, 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 you mentioned it, um, that mm -hmm. there's, there could be more, uh, more indigenous peoples from the Russian region in leadership roles. Um, yeah. There could be a misconception out there. About, about the Russian region. I don't know about it. Um, I only know from, from, from my experience is that for me, the Russian indigenous region is a gray area and I'd like to learn more about it. Uh, but that's not, not necessarily a misconception. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, is there a misconception? That, that, um, um, and if so, what is it so that we all can address it? Yeah, so I, I believe that um, for many, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, in the UN, uh, like for practical reasons, uh, it is important to know and to, sp to speak English. Okay. Uh, and this is why, for example, when we selected our representatives to the steering committee of in international decade, so there was a whole dialogue about it. So some people said that there is, there should be no requirement uh, on, on language skills, because Russian is also one of the six official languages. But UNESCO Secretariat uh, uh, insisted that it is important for, for the people to be efficient on the steering committee, that they know, uh, you know, they, they speak English or French uh, as to um, languages of uh, communication there. Uh, so in, um, in, in the leadership positions, in the forum or Emory or elsewhere, special rapporteur. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it is equally important to uh, to speak English, right? Because otherwise, uh, it is it will be just very difficult uh, difficult to perform these important roles. Because uh, as we discussed, all this much of this work is behind the scene, is negotiations. Is I know how the special rapporteur, for example. Uh, sometimes doesn't attend a uh, permanent forum session for many days because it has, uh, you know, all these conversations uh, with ambassadors, with uh, diplomats, with all these, uh, with indigenous peoples, with uh, agencies and so on. So it's like very hard 24-7 uh, uh, work, uh, lobby to lobby and, and negotiate. So, and, and this is all could, could be done uh, in, in, in an, one of the work languages, working languages of the UN, which is French or English, but English probably most, most importantly. And many uh, members of the permanent forum from my region, unfortunately, uh, cannot speak English. So that's the problem. And uh, maybe they wanted to, or uh, at some point wanted to be in leadership, leadership roles, but just they uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't be because of this, very practical, uh, very practical reason. Um, I, 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 I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, so my, my, my child is crying there. I hope it's not very um, uh, problematic for the listeners, but anyways, so um, it is kind of, um, I mean, I, I think really personally that uh, Russian representatives in all these bodies are very respected. So it is not um, that they are put aside by others. Um, and probably they are also very humble uh, to put themselves forward or they, they just enjoy their positions as regular experts or sometimes vice chairs or something like this. Uh, but I think for the region, for indigenous peoples in my region, it is also important that the representative at some point is in leadership role because it mobilizes resources. It gets a chance 
for the indigenous peoples of this region to raise their profile uh, while, they, while they speak uh, with the government, for example. Uh, th this is so important because uh, um, I, I, I've heard that uh, from indigenous people. So they, uh, their positions, uh, positions of regular communities uh, will have a, a, a higher profile when one of the representatives is in a leadership position in the world. So that they, they can just refer to that. They can, uh, you know, use the authority uh, of of this situation in in their dialogue and and advocacy uh, locally and domestically. Um, and yeah, and I think um, it is also good, as Megan Davis said, because she, I think, when she was there at the permanent forum, they established the practice of rotation. Because when Wiki Tauli Corpus was like for five years, I think, or six years as chair. So after that, they established this rotation system, so year by year, uh, and I think that was right because and what they had, uh, they had an argument, uh, in, in, you know, in favor of it. Um, it's that people should learn how it is to chair because it is not, it is not just um, an enjoyful, uh, a joyful, um, a prestigious job. It is such a responsibility. Uh, you have to listen all the time. You have to, you know, take notes and 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 uh, provide and and extend compassion uh, and manage um, the moderation very wisely and um, uh, profoundly. So it it is um, it is a very hard job, I, I should say. Uh, and I, I I'm not sure. So not not all of, not all people are ready to this uh one should be strong um and um um and diplomatic to do that so um so that's why i, I mean probably not all of the leaders from my region want to do it but those who want so they they should have a chance to do it i think yeah that's <laughs> that's a perfect way of describing um both the necessity as well as the capacity required, um, and that it's it's not a cakewalk, uh, definitely not um, in terms of um, chairing a meeting or facilitating or being a chairperson repertoir. Um, thank you so much for for that insight. Um, all right, yeah, I'll I'll give the last. Um, is there anything that um, we did not touch upon, but you like? Oh my God, Ghazali! I cannot believe you did not ask me about this. <laughs> uh, you're such an asshole. Um, is it before? Yeah, before before we 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 close this conversation because you, you've you've shared so much knowledge, and I love I love the level of humility that you that continue to, to to deploy, whilst also sharing hands-on practical knowledge uh, for people that are. I can I can I can imagine a a um. Uh, a young student uh, from um, from the Russian region also wanted to uh, to, to to defend the rights of indigenous peoples um, uh, and listening to this conversation, or watching this conversation, and getting an insight into from from her own people's region point of view, in, ter in terms of um, the international indigenous movement. Um, so. Yeah, is there anything that that we did not touch upon? And obviously, we can always do another episode um, at, at some point. Um, just let me know if you, you if you have any ideas um, that you another decade or something that you're you're going to launch uh, or an international international year. Let me know. Uh, <laughs> definitely would like to pick your brain about it. Um, yeah, is, is there anything that um, you really want to uh, still want to put forward? Anything. I mean, um, I think, and want to thank you very much for for the very rich conversation and your own insights to it, and um, uh, very well prepared questions. And and I think some of them, them just were not prepared and just came came up with the conversation. So I think uh, it was a very lively uh, experience, and and I like this very much. Um, I, I I can't believe that I can't believe that we. We did it for three hours. I thought it's so, so long you, time, but it's like so short, actually. 
<laughs> you you did it for three hours. I just I just threw in some words and you just uh, you just went with it, which is which is super cool. Uh, yeah. I hope it's I hope it's useful. Uh, I hope it's useful for for the uh, listeners and for the possible uh, people who who get interested in in this. Uh, so I'm I'm trying to be open to be open. Um, uh, it, it's just I mean sometimes it's hard because you have like um, hundreds of emails every day. And uh, it's impossible to reply all the time, but but I, I'm still trying to to do my best to you know to be visible enough and and um, for the constituency and and uh, uh, responsive enough uh, for the people that are that get interested in this uh, indigenous affairs and, and human rights advocacy and and so on and um, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm I'm also like. Um, we just started off a, a podcast here uh, because I don't know. Um, I didn't say in the beginning, but I, I'm also like here in in another life. Uh, let's say uh, I'm a, a coordination a coordinator of a project here, which the project is about handicraft. So we uh, it's a um, northern crafts ID project, um, identity development of northern crafts. Crafts it's a, a long name, and and so in this project we want to do. Uh, um, like it's it's about um, entrepreneurship. So we uh, help craftsmen to become efficient entrepreneurship so they can uh, produce, but also live on their production and, and develop uh, good business uh, and support not only themselves, but also the community. And it's all, it's, it's uh, for the most part in Karelia, it's, it's about indigenous handicrafts and indigenous craftsmen. Um, and and this is um, uh, this year actually is is um, declared by the UN as International Year of um, a Creative Economy for Sustainable Development. So and and creative economy is a sphere that is growing so quickly. I think it's it's it, it, it's very dynamic uh, right now. Uh, and that, so we are we just started a podcast as well. Uh, where we speak with our guests on on the uh, on on how to be uh, an entrepreneur uh, and how to be a, a craftsman that wants to preserve cultural heritage, uh, but also a good entrepreneur. So indigenous entrepreneurship is one of the focuses there. And so I'm learning how to be uh, how to be you actually how to be the one who interviews, uh, and it's. It's amazing how you did it. So I wanna, I, I learned a lot. So um, and it will be very useful for my podcast um, uh, podcast experience here. <laughs> it's it's all trial and error, my friend. It's just just um, um, well, you've so so people know. Like I sent Alexei um, some questions and like I what, what's and because a, a conversation like this, it's not a, this is not an interview. This is a conversation. Um, I just want to put him in the spotlight, uh, learn from him. Uh, so. Obviously, you want to pick his brain, so I sent him some questions. Like, all right, um, so some some basic questions, so that I have a like a an idea of what, what Alexei wants to what he wants to talk about, and um, and then you, you use it that as a as a as a framework as a skeleton thing, um, so that you um, yeah have a good have a good conversation that people like Alexei can can feel comfortable in. Um, because um, yeah, it, it is super scary for a lot of people um, to sit for three hours and talk about themselves. Um, uh, you know, it, it can be scary. Um, and also, a lot of people that think like when you talk about Indians, indigenous rights, or and which is also like close to politics, that a podcast is about like oh, I got you there. Like I want to, I want to nail you on a certain topic, and that's not what I want to talk about. I want to learn the the person, Alexei Tsikarev, what, what makes you tick, uh, why you do what you do. And that's, that's more important than political positions or what, whatever, um, because the person behind the position is, is more important. Um, and I think that is, that is it, and this trial and error, you, you, you try different things. What is, um, so you just started this podcast, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, have you already recorded some, some conversations? Um, or are planning to? Yeah, we have recorded um, 
uh, two episodes, I think. So we recorded more, but um, uh, we recorded more interviews, but uh, released two episodes. And it's not only me who is uh, uh, hosting it. So we, we, the three of us, and sometimes we are the three of us interviewing one or couple of people or just one of us. Uh, so yeah, just two episodes at the moment. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious uh, based on these two episodes that that, that you uh, published when we talk about um, handicrafts and indigenous entrepreneurship. W what did you already learn uh, f from that? Is there anything that that um, in terms of takeaways, like oh, a perspective or a practice, um, anything that um, yeah you picked up from those conversations? Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's a lot of interesting information uh, coming out of it. And one, for example, is that uh, it is very hard for indigenous peoples to be entrepreneurs because they really uh, don't don't think you know money matters. So they uh, kind of they want and what is uh, main goal? Why they do the handicrafts? When they engage themselves with this? Uh, it is the passion about it, the creative, the opportunity to create something, uh, the opportunity to reproduce their cultural patterns, and uh, and money is something uh, secondary to to this. And and so, um, but our like when we um, established this project, so we we wanted to to just you know because we see the potential. In handicrafts, so we want them to, um, you know, to benefit from it, and we want that the handicrafts would be prestigious. It's not just because some people think it's oh, I can do the same. It just you know why it's so expensive. Um, yeah, we we, we want to make it prestigious, so the 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 manual labor uh, is not that easy. It's it's uh, it, it and also. Uh, what we what we speak about with hand with uh, with craftsmen is that all of them don't sell uh, just the crafts. They represent their story. Uh, they represent their identity, uh, identity of their people, and uh, and also uh, you know. The, the the village they they live in the the city so they they they, they sell the story actually uh, and the heritage and it's it's not about uh, just the physical thing <laughs> yeah so I, I, it, it's very interesting all of this I'm and I'm also learning because like a year a year ago I was not um, engaged with handicraft at all but but um, during this year in the project, it's I, I've learned a lot on, on handicrafts and, and these people who are engaged. All right, well, let's let's let, let's let's end with the shameless plug then. Um, po uh, the podcast where where can people listen to it? Obviously, I assume it's in Russian and uh, Russian language. Yeah. So uh, people that are listening that are Russian speaking or know uh, and know um, a little bit of Russian, um, where can people? What's the name of the podcast and or yeah website um yeah well and and also papers that you produced uh, um yeah do, so that people know like follow up on what we what we talked about and you also talked about uh report on a paper that you do on, on participation within the uh, um um the, re the sorry paper study a study mm -hmm. you did for the print form um, yeah, basically, all right, if people want to know more about Alexis Tsikarev and the, the work that you do, including the podcast, um, what should people look out for? How sh what should people Google or listen to or read? Um, yeah, there is, a, there is a website of my NGO uh, uh, that I had at the moment. It's um, uh, Center... Center for Support of Indigenous Peoples and, and Civil Diplomacy, Jan Karelia, Nuori Karela, it is in my language. Uh, so there is a website of it, uh, Nuori Karela uh, And um, it has some information in English, some, in, some information in Russian and Karelian. Um, and uh, we, 
try to publish their like everything relevant to our work on language preservation on uh, culture on uh, handicrafts and so on so this is this is one kind of um, good source on my my account so I'm uh, in on Instagram and Facebook and Russian social media so this is where I I'm trying to be active as well right um, yeah and so so people know uh, um, two papers that that Alexei uh, mentioned one is on indigenous languages uh, co-authored by um, Alexei himself and um, Kristen Carpenter, as well as Indigenous Peoples and Diplomacy uh, on the world stage, also co-written by, you guys are an amazing tag team, um, <laughs> Alexei Tikarev and Kristen Carpenter. Um, two uh, very well-written papers, very accurate, very current. I highly recommend people to read it. Um, basically, out of any, everything that, that Alexei has written um, is worth reading. Um, yeah, so and I'll put the links in the show notes so that so that you can follow up a little, read, read a little bit on your own in your own tempo at your own pace in your own time, um, and yeah, keep following him on an Instagram and Facebook. Um, it's all also um, regular uh, post regularly updates and Facebook. Unfortunately, if you're not fluent in Russian, it, it does the, this translate to English feature, so you're good with that. Um, let's say. Uh, yeah, we could talk for hours more, um, but I know that you have you have children screaming in the, back, in the background, um, so I I won't keep you uh, too long. I already kept you way too long, um, obviously. Um, but thank you so much for your time, man. Um, your friend, your colleague, um, you, you're an amazing person. Keep doing what you do. Um, I, I really hope that you succeed in um at the print forum um you you have the right baggage the mindset to really excel at the print forum so really looking forward to seeing you seeing you at work even though it's virtual um at, at the print forum and uh, yeah like i said you know hey if you got a new decade coming up let me know i'll uh i, I want to know i want to ask some questions i want to have this conversation again because I, I love listening to you man um yeah uh, and this is the hard part i i don't know how how to end a conversation um so uh, um yeah final final words man uh, i'll leave it up to you and and, and then we'll um yeah I'll, I'll let you go yeah thank you very much Ghazali. i'm really happy to be on on your podcast and um uh, uh hope to see you soon somewhere in person uh i don't know i mean permanent form is this year virtual as you said but uh, uh, I think soon pandemic will be over and everything will go back to uh, normal <laughs> yeah so we can we can see and talk uh, about these things and the end yeah Thank well let, let's aim for um, a, a drink at La Terras at uh, in Geneva um, or, or somewhere else you know let, let, let's aim and for kids. that <laughs> or kids <laughs> uh, not singing again um, but <laughs> uh definitely let, let's say for that uh continue this conversation and yeah man i appreciate it and thank you so much for your time man have a thank have you. a good evening evening over there yeah yes all right man thank appreciate you. it bye-bye bye this is the gomaluku podcast <laughs>